And I call on Margaret Mitchell to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open this debate on the Justice Committee's inquiry and report into the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, which is the bulwark of our criminal justice system, prosecuting hundreds of cases each day in our courts. The only other committee inquiry into the service concluded in 2003. Since then, reform of the criminal law and procedure has proceeded apace. The committee therefore agreed that an inquiry into the service was long overdue and agreed to make this our first major inquiry focusing on the role of the COPFS as a prosecutor. The service's other key role, investigating deaths and carrying out fatal accident inquiries, having been looked at by the previous Justice Committee. The, Mickey, the committee took evidence over four months and made visits to Inverness, to Hamilton and to Edinburgh Sheriff Court, hearing from prosecutors and defence agents, the judiciary, trade unions, the police, victim support services and victims themselves. The committee extends its grateful thanks to all those who contributed to the inquiry and is conscious that in certain instances it took some courage to do so. I thank my colleagues on the committee for their hard work during the inquiry and the clerks for painstakingly collating the evidence gathered for the report. My thanks too goes to the Crown Office itself for its willingness to cooperate with the committee during the inquiry. The report covers five main themes. In the limited time, I will merely introduce each theme. Others will focus on particular issues. The resourcing of the COPFS is the first theme. Here, members heard directly from those working at the coalface, not just prosecutors and admin staff, but also defence agents. The picture which emerged was one of a long hours culture, with junior staff being used as court fodder and prosecutors frequently facing totally inadequate preparation time. This was reflected in above average sickness rates and returns from staff surveys indicating low morale, a clearly worrying situation aggravated by the large number of temporary and short term contracts and temporary promotions. This in turn contributed to a reluctance to speak out. In response, the Lord Advocate and the Crown Agent stated staff had been consulted about the changes required and that the latest staff surveys indicated that the organ organisation may be turning the corner. Whilst encouraging, it's still early days and no amount of listening exercises can address fundamental concerns about the adequacy of resources. The fact is that the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service budget has seen a marked decline in real terms for a de decade, whilst at the same time both demand and the number of complex solemn cases is increasing. This year, the COPFS's budget has declined further in real terms, and the committee heard with growing concern that the Crown agent estimated that around 30 staff may have to be shed to make ends meet. Quite simply, whilst the committee notes the Lord Advocate's remarks that this year's financial allocation is a sound settlement, it considers that the staff's resilience has been tested almost beyond endurance in recent years. It should not be tested to breaking point. The second major theme is efficiency of the prosecution system. The committee report stated, change is necessary before the risks that are undoubtedly embedded in the prosecution system as presently constituted begin to crystallise. This change must reflect inherent inefficiencies in the prosecution system, including the prevalence of churn, which is the, postpone the postponement or delay of court hearings. This wastes court time and lowers overall confidence in the criminal justice system. Statistics show that the most common cause of churn is a Crown motion to adjourn because a key witness is not present. There are various reasons for this non-appearance, and whilst the service cannot always be held responsible if a witness fails to attend court, 
it could do more. If the NHS now routinely updates individuals by text, then surely the prosecution service can use this communication to inform witnesses whether their appearance is required or not. Secondly, trial dates should not be scheduled when there is little prospect of them proceeding because the Crown will not be ready. And finally, a rethink is required on how trial evidence is gathered and presented. There is a recognition of this with the Lord President describing our criminal system as Victorian in many of its practices. Members heard more use could be made of modern technology to capture and crystallise evidence in advance of a trial and that this will require cultural change in the way practitioners, including defence practitioners, deal with court business. It's clear the Lord, and Lord Advocate understands that and is personally committed to reform. Furthermore, members welcome the ongoing work of the Evidence and Procedure Review and the Justice Digital Strategy, both of which are intended to do, deliver many of the changes that are needed. Crucially, however, the committee expressed concern about both projects seemingly being open-ended in nature and the fact that some milestones set out in the digital strategy appear to have already been missed. The responses from the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service and the Scottish Government to the committee's conclusions in this area essentially advised the committee to watch this space, indicating promising developments to come. In response, I give notice that the committee will, remain, will maintain a watching brief on this issue, which is much too important to be allowed to, split, to slip, especially given the experience with nearly every other public sector technology project. The third theme covered the effectiveness is the effectiveness of the prosecution service. The bulk of evidence heard gives an impression of the COPFS as just about managing and doing its best to prosecute against a backdrop of decreasing resources. Whilst the committee has stressed that the public should have confidence in the COPFS as on the whole a robust, fair and rigorous public, public prosecutor it nonetheless issues a stark warning. The strains are already showing. Summary cases, including antisocial behaviour, dishonesty or less serious violent crimes that should be the prosecution service core work, are being under-prioritised. The root cause being the COPFS spreading itself too thinly, especially with the increased, increased priority given to domestic abuse and historic child abuse. Whilst justifiable, evidence revealed that other cases were suffering. Meanwhile, the prosecution of certain types of cases, such as wildlife crime and health and safety issue cases, indicates some failings. There was mixed evidence about the centralisation of case marking. The COPFS management stated this had increased the efficiency of the prosecution process. But there have been adverse unintended consequences, including a loss of local fiscal's autonomy, which has resulted in the best disposal not always being deployed. The response from COPFS was disappointing in that the Crown agent appears not to have acknowledged that this loss of local autonomy, perceived or otherwise, can have an adverse impact. The fourth strand focused on victims and lay witnesses. The committee was deeply concerned by evidence that the current process leaves victims and witnesses feeling marginalised, with individuals speaking about a lack of contact with prosecutors before a trial and errors in communication. Some stated that the experience of taking part in the trial process had left them feeling re-traumatised and that, frankly, they would not come forward in future. As a result of the evidence heard, the committee questioned whether the COPFS was fully meeting its legal and moral duty of care towards victims. Whilst the service's formal responsibilities towards victims have greatly increased in recent years, 
its overall budget has fallen. Absolutely no criticism is made in the victim information and advice service and the staff who are employed there who are coping under extremely difficult circumstances. Dr. Leslie Thompson published her review of victims in the criminal justice system close to the conclusion of our inquiry and members agree with many of her conclusions. However, the responses of the Scottish Government and the COPFS fail to respond to or give any of the following information requested by the committee, namely, which recommendations from the Thompson report they propose to accept, what legislative reforms may be necessary, and what is the timetable for implementing recommendations from A, the Thompson review, and B, the evidence and procedure review. I hope that these questions will be answered in the course of this debate. Finally, the last strand of the report covered was the Inspectorate of Prosecution, an organisation intended to provide an independent check on the COPFS. However, it is evident there is little awareness of the Inspectorate's output, which is gravely concerning given it is intended to cover matters of public interest. In particular, the committee heard concerns about the inspectorate drawing so many of its staff from the COPFS. Perceptions matter, and the current arrangements contribute to the perception about the independence of the inspectorate. Here, I'm disappointed with the lack of acknowledgement of this issue from both the COPFS and the inspectorate. Presiding officer, this is a substantial report on a matter of public interest. I look forward to hearing the Lord Advocate's response and other contributions to the challenge the committee has set out in our report, which is to ensure the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal is robust, flexible and fit for the challenges of the 21st century. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. Um, I would just uh, say to all members that we have plenty of time in hand this afternoon for, yes, for extended speeches or interventions or interruptions, should you choose to make or accept them. It's a pleasure now to introduce the Lord Advocate, James Wolfe, to open on behalf of the government. Normally, in these situations, uh, there's a convention here that we allow uh, members who are given their maiden speech to speak uninterrupted. Uh, however, I hope the Lord Advocate will understand that in this case, the Convention probably won't apply to him as a Government Minister. But having said that, Lord Advocate. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, and it's a great uh, privilege and a pleasure to uh, speak in this debate um, as Head of the System of Prosecution in Scotland. Um, when I was an Advocate Deputy um, prosecuting crime in the High Court, I came to appreciate that for a lawyer, there is no job more demanding and no job more important than the prosecution of crime in the public interest. I, I'm grateful to the convener for her remarks this morning and I thank her and all the members of the committee for the care and work which they have put into uh, the inquiry which they've undertaken. Uh, I thank also the members who have taken the view that um, this is a debate that uh, they should attend. Uh, and I would like to add my own gratitude to the convener's gratitude expressed to all those, to all those who gave evidence to uh, the inquiry. I'd like to thank the convener for her acknowledgement that in general, Scotland is fundamentally well served by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in its core role as public prosecutor. I believe that she and the committee were right uh, to reach that conclusion. Day in and day out across Scotland, prosecutors prosecute cases securing justice for the victims of crime and vindicating the public interest in the fair trial of accused persons and the punishment of those who are uh, convicted. No one in this parliament will doubt the importance of that work. The effective, rigorous, fair and independent prosecution of crime in the public interest underpins our freedom and security. 
and it helps to keep our people and communities safe from crime. The effectiveness of the service in fulfilling that core responsibility reflects the skill and commitments of its staff. And I was pleased, but not surprised, uh, to read and hear the consistent evidence, evidence which reflects my own experience about the quality of Scotland's public prosecutors and the staff who uh, support them. Uh, the services staff is its greatest asset, and I'm glad to have uh, the opportunity here in this parliament to pay public tribute to their dedication, professionalism, professionalism and uh, integrity. Uh, indeed. Douglas Ross. I, I'm grateful to the Lord Advocate for giving way. He will understand the discussions we had during our uh, evidence session on the Scottish Government's budget in relation to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And while he quite rightly sees how important the staff are to the COPFS, is he worried that continued cuts to his budget does result in losses in staff, vital staff, to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? Well, Lord Advocate. Yes, thank, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, thank you Mr. Ross. Um, um, I perhaps should, perhaps can deal with the point uh, immediately in, in this way. The convener referred to the anticipated shedding of uh, 30 staff in this financial year. I think it is important to put uh, the question of staff numbers in context um, because uh, the service uh, has sought to protect staff numbers, notwithstanding real reductions in resource over uh, a number of years. Uh, and indeed, the service will continue to seek to release resources um, by making non-staff savings uh, where it can. Um, and that anticipated loss of 30 staff should be put in context in this way, that in April 2017, uh, this year, the staff complement of COPFS was 1,599, uh, which compares with a figure of 1,537 in March 2012. And if one looks at the legal staff, the uh, equivalent figures in April of this year were full-time equivalent 520, as compared with 485 in March uh, 2012. So while the service recognizes, recognizes the challenges which come with um, uh, the reduction in real resources over time, it has been able to make choices which protect uh, the frontline uh, services. Uh, and perhaps I should make this more general point that like other public services, Scotland's prosecution service has to respond to a changing environment. It has to seek to meet public expectations. And it has to do that against a background of public sector funding uh, restraint. Um, and I recognize uh, that the committee's report has highlighted some of the challenges which the service faces, uh, challenges which I take seriously and I know that the leadership of the service takes seriously. Uh, and while there can be no room for complacency, I am confident that the service will rise to those challenges. It's an organization which over time has shown a remarkable capacity to absorb and effect change and which has the confidence, the confidence uh, to learn from experience. At this stage of the debate, um, I'd like to comment on three of the matters which the committee has raised. Uh, first of all, and it really picks up the on Mr. Rossi's question. The service values its staff. I listened to the evidence to the committee about the pressures which the staff of the service are under. And the service understands those pressures, which is precisely why, over time, it's sought to protect uh, staff numbers. Uh, and I can say in response to two particular points to which the convener referred, that uh, since the committee took evidence the service has taken steps to reduce significantly the number of staff on temporary promotion and fixed term contracts. Um, and the sickness rate uh, has already reduced uh, since the date of the committee's report. As the committee reports, the service has developed and is implementing a Fair Futures project which aims to promote the well-being and working lives of all its staff. 
Now, since my first day in office as Lord Advocate, I've emphasised the trust which I place in those who prosecute crime in Scotland. And the service values its staff, it champions their commitment and professionalism, and it wants them to be confident that they will have rewarding careers serving the interests of justice in Scotland. But the second point I'd like to make at this stage of the debate is that the service is committed to improvement and reform, not just in its own practices, but across the criminal justice system. And I'm pleased that the committee has endorsed the need uh, for systemic reform. Uh, indeed. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Lord Advocate for taking the uh, intervention and warmly welcome the steps that have been taken to address the concerns that were raised with us about the number of temporary promotions and fixed term contracts. As a flip side to that, and, and, and in no means trying to um, argue the counter, um, does he envisage there therefore being um, some issues around providing opportunities for newly qualified uh, personnel to come into the Crown Office to benefit from the training and the experience that others have benefited from up until now as a result of the changes that he is quite rightly uh, taking forward with the Crown agent? No, don't forget. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr MacArthur for um, raising the point of training. Um, Crown Office uh, traineeships are highly sought after. Um, they provide a high quality uh, experience, um, particularly for individuals who are interested uh, in uh, court work. Um, and um, I certainly envisage that the service will continue to take, uh, uh, to, 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 to take uh, trainees. The, picking up on the point that the convener made in the context of reform, um, uh, she spoke of churn. Um, there are many reasons for churn in the criminal justice system. Um, we, we know that the vast majority of Crown motions to adjourn cases in the summary courts are due to the non-attendance of a critical witness. And that perhaps illustrates the challenge of reforming uh, the justice uh, system. We have a justice system which requires all the necessary people to be in the same room at the same time. Um, inefficiencies in the system not only impose costs on the Crown and other criminal justice agencies, but place demands on members of the public who attend court as witnesses or otherwise. Uh, and I'm committed to working with others to change the system uh, for the better. Reforms to solemn criminal business in the Sheriff Court commenced last week, and the Crown Office is working with the Scottish Court Service and others through the Evidence and Procedure Review on the reform of summary justice, as well as on the Justice Digital Strategy. And the service will continue to work both internally and with others, to make changes which may not sound very exciting, but which make a real practical difference, like the police witness scheduler, which seeks to manage effectively the demands which the system places on our police officers. The third point I'd like to touch on at this stage is the services support for victims and witnesses. As prosecutors, we cannot do our job unless victims and witnesses come forward and speak up. The service led the way in Scotland in acknowledging the need to support victims of crime. And we have, as a society, come a long way in a short time in recognising that need. But we must continue to improve. The committee reports the current process sometimes leaves victims and witnesses feeling marginalised. The evidence which the committee heard demonstrated that in some cases, the service to victims has not met the standard which the service normally achieves and which it expects of staff. The Crown Office's VIA service, which provides advice and information to vulnerable victims and witnesses, has a significant workload which has substantially increased over time and which has increased uh, 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 again as a result of the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014. The service has responded by undertaking, um, I, I think I'll continue for the moment. Um, the service has responded by undertaking a review of the VIA service. It has implemented most of the recommendations of that review and the indications are that the immediate challenges posed by the increased referrals to VIA have to a significant degree been met. But the service will continue to build on that work and on the work of the committee to analyze the impact of the changes and the extent of any remaining unmet need which falls within its remit. And the service is also considering how it can better obtain feedback from victims so that it can learn 
from their experience. The committee's report signals that we should collectively uh, think more broadly about the position of victims. First of all, as prosecutors, we understand that vulnerable witnesses and victims of crime, particularly children, sometimes find the experience of giving evidence traumatic and difficult. And that's why we're working with others to consider whether we can and should change the way that we take evidence from children and other vulnerable witnesses. And it's why I've supported the court's recent initiative in relation to taking, out, taking evidence on commission. And second, the committee recognizes that the needs of victims go beyond what the prosecution service on its own can or should provide. That's why the previous Solicitor General, Leslie Thompson, undertook a review of the provision for supporting victims of crime. And that's why building on that review and the recommendations of the committee, the service will consider with partners through the Justice Board what can be done in that regard. Um, I, 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 I'll give way to the convener, of course. Mark Mitchell. To see if there is now a timetable for implementation of the Thompson Review recommendations and also of the digital strategy to which he's already referred. Lord Advocate. Yes, um, the convener will appreciate that in particular the Thompson Review ra you know, raises a, a, a very wide-ranging uh, set of questions which really need to be taken forward through the, uh, through the uh, uh, Justice Board. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of, of, of my time and perhaps I can finish just by, by saying this, um, that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is an organization which has demonstrated a remarkable capacity to absorb and effect change. It recognizes the need for change. It's planning for change and it seeks to be a leader of change in the wider criminal justice system. It is a robust and flexible organization. In addressing the challenges before it, I know that the service will remain committed to its core responsibility to the people of Scotland, which is to be an effective rigorous, fair, and independent prosecutor of crime in the public interest. I thank the committee for its work, uh, and I look forward to working with the committee as together we seek to effect change in the justice system. And I look forward to this debate. Thank you, and I call on Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and could I congratulate the Lord Advocate on his uh, first speech in the Chamber. From the very beginning, on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, and I'm sure all members, I want to reiterate the points which have been made by both the Lord Advocate and the Convener, uh, points that were made by almost every witness when they came before the committee about the staff of the Crown Office. Everyone praised the staff of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. They praised their professionalism and they praised their dedication. However, we also heard of the difficulties they face. Many people accustomed to working at the front line of the system argued that a lack of resources was impacting on the COPFS's performance. The Edinburgh Bar Association's overall impression of the Crown Office was an organisation struggling manfully in difficult circumstances. The problem that displays itself is in every department is understaffing. So we must ask then, why did the do we have the situation where the Scottish Government, the SNP, aware of these pressures, aware of these comments from witnesses, with SNP members on the committee hearing these concerns, still decided to put through a real terms cut in the Crown Office budget? Paragraphs 47 and 48 of our report outline the COPFS budget for 2017-18 financial year having a real terms reduction of £1.5 million. I will give way. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. Uh, does the member share my disappointment that the Cabinet Secretary has now left the debate, even though one of the key issues raised by the committee report is the funding of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? Yeah. Douglas Ross. I I'm sometimes on a bit of thin ice to complain about other people not being in this chamber, <laughs> uh, but, but I recognise the comments made by Ms Baker. Um, as, as Margaret Mitchell uh, mentioned in her remarks, uh, the Crown Agent told the committee that approximately half of this £1.5 million reduction will be met through savings in the staff budget. The government ignored the evidence from Fiona Eady of the FDA, who told the committee, and I quote, I fully expect our senior manager to give evidence to the Parliament and say that he can probably just about manage to deliver the same service again with the same money next year. She continued, however, if the committee wants to see the sorts of improvements that we have spoken about today and the standard of service that we all want to deliver and that the people of Scotland expect, additional resources are required. 
What we got was not a budget for the Crown Office with the same money as last year, or a budget with the increase which staff at the front line said was essential to deliver the standard of service people in the Crown Office want to provide and the public should expect. No. Instead, we got a cut from this SNP Government. They shut their eyes and they covered their ears to ignore the testimonies we received as a committee and a parliament. A cut that will not deliver the changes and improvements that we all want to see in the service and a cut which I believe the staff will rightly feel let down by by this Scottish Government because of it. Other issues which came up in our four-month inquiry included much needed discussion over digital investment in our court system and I've listened to what the Lord Advocate has said and I think we must be looking forward to the digital strategy being implemented. But it seems absolutely incredulous that in 2017 we can have cases in Scotland delayed because the system used to view evidence by the police is different from that used to view by defence solicitors. The incompatibility of these systems lead to delays, inconvenience of witnesses and manifest a general perception that our court system remains not fit for purpose when it comes to technology. And clearly this has an impact on the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. I will give way. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. W without rebutting the point that's just been made, I wonder if the member might care to consider uh, whether there have always been challenges with technology for decades and that perhaps they're being opened up to the public gaze and engaged with is something we should welcome, albeit we should continue to hold the government and indeed the fiscal service to account for delivering effective change. Yeah, I fully agree with the remarks by Mr Stevenson and I think it was encouraging that as a committee of all uh, parties, MSPs on the Justice Committee recognise the opportunities but also the difficulties in achieving some of the outcomes we hope to see from uh, a digital uh, improvement within our court system. Uh, the committee also heard from the bar associations about court closures and the impact that the amount of scheduled cases which end up not being heard are as a result of the number of courts which have been closed across Scotland. Witnesses get cited. They give up their time to attend court only to be told that the case is not proceeding. Again, this portrays a very poor image of our system uh, and it was given as a reason by many witnesses why uh, they have turned up for one court case and then to be turned away. They may even in the future be deterred from reporting a crime given the experiences they face giving evidence in an earlier crime. Communication or a lack of it was highlighted by both witnesses and solicitors. Defence solicitors came to the committee and told us how they were unable to speak to prosecutors before a case due to a centralised call system that seemed to work for no one. Now, I welcome the assurances that this was being improved, but it's worrying that this issue had to be raised at committee, having previously been highlighted regularly by both defence solicitors and staff within the Crown Office. Uh, but at least we are now starting to see possible improvements witness, uh, with it. And witnesses and victims told us of their disappointment and the lack of communication they received before, during and after court appearances. Again, this problem seemed rooted in the fact there were too few staff under too much pressure. Margaret Mitchell has already mentioned centralised marking and churn in our court system, and I know other members will want to discuss that more fully as we go along. But in a, a large report, there are only a few issues I can concentrate on. But I do want to... Uh, finally look at the area the committee asked each witness about, and that was the Inspectorate of Prosecution in Scotland. The most common response we received from witnesses, people intrinsically involved in this area, was they had never heard of the IPS or were unaware of its work. This is an inspectorate that oversees the work of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, yet they are seen as almost anonymous. We had quotes from the Scottish uh, Borders Rape Crisis Centre. They said, I have no awareness of IPS. The Scottish Police Federation said the SPF is not aware of the IPS and cannot comment on its resources or its effectiveness. An individual witness in his committee submission said, I have never heard of the Inspectorate of Prosecution. And even more worryingly, the Sheriff's Association said, we do not receive information about the IPS or its practices. Now, while I accept and welcome the uh, comment by the current Chief Inspector of Prosecution in Scotland that they are aware of their need to improve their profile, it is surely a very poor reflection on a body that was established in 2003 that it has such a poor profile of the vital work it is doing. To conclude, Presiding Officer, I want to thank Margaret Mitchell for her stewardship of this inquiry and to all the witnesses who gave evidence. 
The committee did conclude that Scotland is fundamentally well served by the Crown Office and Procurator F Fiscal Service as a public prosecutor. But there is more to do, and those of us on these benches will monitor how both the Crown Office and the Scottish Government fully respond to this inquiry to get the very best outcome for everyone who works within the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service or use this vital service. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Claire Baker to open for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I start by thanking the Justice Committee for their inquiry report and today's debate. Uh, over the course of the afternoon, it is important to remember the following quote from the executive summary of the report. During almost five months of evidence taking, the Justice Committee heard praise for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, its professionalism and its dedicated, hard-working staff. On the whole, the public should have confidence that it is a rigorous and fair prosecutor. Nobody today can be in any doubt about the dedication of the staff working at the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service. Um, as a committee substitute, I was able to attend the session of evidence at the Crown Office, where we received um, valuable evidence ranging from discussions around cybercrime to around victim support and to domestic abuse. And I think there we all had the opportunity to see how hard uh, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service works. Uh, we all acknowledge and appreciate the roles that they do in ensuring justice is served throughout Scotland. But we must also remember the lines in the report that followed, which said, the service remains under considerable pressure. There can be no room for complacency. That is why today's debate, the inquiry and the report is important. And by the end of the afternoon, we must be confident that the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service in Scotland has the support and the resources it needs. We need to seek commitments from the Lord Advocate and the Scottish Government, which give us this confidence. According to the Prosecutors Union, the FDA, we know that the COPF, sorry, COPFS's funding has decreased by over a fifth in real terms and that posts will be reduced. Court closures have taken place, more complex and historical cases have been brought forward and the law is ever evolving and reforming. All of this has consequences. I'm at the start of the year, I released statistics from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, which highlights the impact these changes are having. The number of trials being adjourned due to a lack of court time has increased by 66%. Following the recent court closures, there has been a 2.2% decrease in the number of days of court sittings in Scotland. And at the same time, there has been a 59% increase in jury trials and a 30% increase in summary trials called. At the same time, we've seen a real terms cut to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And the rationalisation of courts was inevitably going to lead to more pressure on those that are still operating. And this was concerns raised by the Edinburgh and Aberdeen Bar Associations as well as others during the course of the evidence taking. President Officer, I appreciate that a degree of churn is inevitable and other members have spoken about this. But the numbers of adjournments and delays are going in the wrong direction. This is a problem which is increasing at the moment, not getting better. This is an issue not just for the court services or the Crown Office, but for the government as well. We must see coordinated action from all to address this. And I do recognise the recent and planned changes which the Crown Office have said they will improve the situation in response to the committee's report. The committee's report did make a number of recommendations directly related to the efficiency of the prosecution service, from dealing with churn to witnesses not attending to better case management. There's a need for improvements to all of this in the interest of victims and the public purse. Um, as Margaret Mitchell highlighted, the increased pressure on the Crown Office has led to debate around priorities and decision making. And, President Officer, I know that this chamber and the government take the issue of domestic abuse seriously. I welcome the positive work that has been undertaken by Police Scotland and the Proxicator Fiscal Service in recent years to tackle such crime. And I look forward to working with the Justice Secretary as he brings his domestic abuse bill through Parliament. However, one thing that struck me throughout this committee inquiry was the profile given to domestic abuse, um, partly by the committee and also by the media coverage of the inquiry, some of which, it has to be said, was unhelpful. For example, during this inquiry, we heard court cases described as a rigmarole and a charade, and that the police would hoover up everything in the hope that we miss nothing. I appreciate this is an emotive issue, therefore I'd urge all of us, politicians and those in senior positions in relevant organisations to discuss this matter sensitively. 
I am not opposed to witnesses asking difficult questions to challenge the way that things are done, but we must ensure it is robust evidence. Anecdotal evidence was routinely used that risked at times undermining the progress that has been made in tackling this crime. And with a conviction rate for domestic abuse that is upwards of 80%, and knowing that in the past five years the number of people convicted has increased, we can be confident that the work undertaken by our police and by the Procurator Fiscal Service is changing, and that significant progress is being made in recognising domestic abuse as a crime. Yet it is clear there are other areas that still need to demand our focus and attention. That only 12% of reported rapes and attempted rapes make it to court in Scotland is a statistic that indicates that the system is not working. And 88% of reported rapes fail to make it to court. We have seen from a recent landmark case that serious questions can be raised towards the Crown Office regarding their decision not to proceed with some of these cases. And given recent rulings, there is a concern that more rape victims may now take their action to a civil court as they feel let down by the current criminal court system. Yet by doing so, they are giving up key protections, such as anonymity. Rape should always be treated as a criminal matter. And the Crown Office and the Scottish Government must make this clear that they believe this to be the case as well. The committee report makes several recommendations that I hope the Crown Office and the Government will take seriously. I appreciate that while the Lord Advocate viewed the budget for the year ahead as a sound settlement, much of the evidence received by the inquiry does seem to indicate that this is a minority view. The committee heard that staff are expected to work under increasingly difficult financial circumstances. And I do appreciate the Lord Advocate's statement this afternoon about the value that the Crown Office places on, on the staff, but we do anticipate that job losses um, are coming down the line. We know from the inquiry that we have staff on short-term contracts, on long-term temporary promotions and on sick leave. And I share the committee's concern that a lack of preparation time means that the time limits in solemn trials have been routinely exceeded, and this must be addressed. And I do recognise from the Crown Office Crown Office's response to the committee's report that they also recognise this situation is unsustainable and I hope that the measures they have indicated to address some of these um, issues do move forward um, quickly. Uh, I also want to further stress the committee's view that the serious feelings brought forward by victims of crime is unacceptable and as the convener has already stated in her opening remarks this includes a lack of communication, misinformation, delays and adjournments but also any special measures that were requested were inadequate and that victims did not always feel secure outside of the courtroom. That these experiences have led to some to reflect that they would never have reported the crime in the first place if they had understood what they were going to have to experience is a serious failing and we need to see action to ensure this is not the case going forward. I would also like to see greater progress in the provision of measures to meet the needs of children and young people. And I recognise the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to this area, but I share the committee's view that clarity over a publication date for the evidence and procedure review is important in moving this work forward in an informed and cooperative manner. Presiding officer, this is a very wide-ranging report, and while today's debate is important, there is much in the report to reflect on and take forward in this parliament. The Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service have a difficult job, and it is one that they perform well. We must be watchful that the pressures and challenges the report has identified does not weaken the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and that we must ensure that confidence can be maintained for this crucial service in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. I move to the open debate, and um, as you're aware, we can be generous with time. I call Ben McPherson, to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Mr. McPherson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like others, I would first of all like to thank all of those who came to the committee to give evidence, fellow committee members and the clerks for their assistance during the inquiry. The convener and others have spoken through this, many of the substantial issues in the report, but I would like to, to highlight a few things of, of particular uh, significance uh, to myself. Presiding officer, let me also begin by saying that this inquiry into the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service was timely and important. It has highlighted numerous areas where change and improvement can and should be made. And at the same time, it has shown that the public can and should have confidence that the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service is a rigorous and fair prosecutor and that we are fundamentally well served by all of those involved in our criminal justice system. 
Currently in Scotland, we are in a situation where crime and the fear of crime have fallen. Recorded crime is at its lowest level for 42 years and the reconviction re rate is now at its lowest for 18 years. But of course, progress is still required. We need to make all of our communities safer. And therefore, I support the Scottish Government's agenda for a strategic approach to justice, one that tackles offending and one that is effective at both preventing crime and reducing reoffending. Presiding officer, the remit of the inquiry that the committee undertook, uh, within the remit of the inquiry, a key focus was the effectiveness and efficiency of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service and how well it works with other stakeholders in the criminal justice system and beyond. This is an aspect of the COPFC's work that I have seen in practice and been involved with at a local level in the constituency I represent. Working to tackle pertinent issues of youth crime in North Edinburgh, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service have recently collaborated and engaged effectively and purposefully with the local community, including constructive engagement and partnership working with the local authority, local police and third sector organisations, predominantly those engaged in youth work. This proactive action by the COPFS has created a collective understanding between all parties about shared objectives to tackle crime in the community and divert young people from engaging in crime. During our inquiry, the committee heard that the COPFS should embody an approach of striving to provide a joined up and complementary service that helps meet the ends of justice. And in my experience, the COPFS is doing this meaningfully and effectively. Creating links with communities and multi-agency work is part of achieving our shared ambition of safer communities. And while there is still much work to do, I am grateful for the difference the COPFS have made in that regard towards reducing crime in North Edinburgh. Presiding officer, in my direct experience as a constituency MSP, the evidence we took as a committee, and throughout the evidence we took as a committee, it is clear that the COPFS is well served by a dedicated, highly professional, hard-working staff doing an excellent job in sometimes challenging circumstances. However, some who gave evidence rightly and powerfully highlighted recent challenges the service has faced throughout the years following the financial crisis in 2008. For example, overwork and over-reliance on short-term contracts and loss of some experienced staff. However, I believe we must use the report to consider how we move forward. And recent feedback from COPFS staff shows improvements are taking place for those working within the service. The most recent staff feedback from 2016 shows evidence of improvement which reflects the significant efforts that have been made over the last two years to consult colleagues during a period of organisational change. For example, 60% of staff reported that they wanted to stay with the COPFS for at least the next three years, which is up 6% and is 17% above the civil service average. 92% of those surveyed reported that they are interested in their work. And there were many other figures which are available in the evidence we took. What's more, presiding officer, it was encouraging to note that in the process of taking evidence, the report we, there was reports that the COPFS staff numbers have increased since 2012. For example, as of 31 October 2016, COPFS has 1,601 members of staff, a modest increase on the staffing complement of 1,537 on 31st of March 2012. And again, there are, are more figures available around those details. For example, there has uh, been a, an increase recently in terms of deputies and senior deputies. And that brings me to a point that Liam MacArthur rightly raised in a, an intervention, which is one around trainee solicitors, which was something that I uh, pursued in the evidence that we took. As the, the Lord Advocate stated in, in an answer to me uh, during the evidence we took, you cannot knit deputies. And therefore, it is important for the COPFS going forward to endeavour to retain top young talent as it comes through and a determination to recruit those and bring them into the service. Now, in the early days of the recession, there was undoubtedly a period of very difficult choices for the COPFS in terms of retention. 
but I was uh, reassured that the Crown Agent and the Lord Advocate made commitments that they are committed to recruit the trainees, uh, the best trainees possible and, and the brightest and the best into the service and that they will seek to, to make sure that there are uh, retention opportunities for those trainees to be de the deputies of the future. We also heard uh, compelling evidence around greater use of harnessing digital technology and that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that there was a, an enthusiasm on behalf of the Lord Advocate and the Crown Agent that uh, for greater use of video technology, whether that in the context of a, of a live link or for pre-recorded evidence, and that this has capacity to avoid unnecessary costs and inconvenience as part of a process of transformational change. And I, I in particular, welcome that with regard to specialised witnesses, uh, specialist witnesses rather, who uh, we want to encourage to give evidence on their expertise and, and uh, for which uh, changing of court dates and uh, travel costs can have a significant impact. Presiding officer, in, in closing, as I stated at the beginning, uh, this inquiry was important. It has shown us that the COPFS is well served by dedicated, hard-working staff, that improvements are ongoing and that, as feedback has shown, progress is being made. But specifically, Presiding officer, I've highlighted how the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service can work collaboratively, particularly with communities, and how this type of joined up approach can enhance the, the government's agenda and all of our ambition for a strategic approach to justice that is more effective at tackling, preventing and reducing crime. Just as joined up work in the community can help us make our community safer, so too can collaborative effort in this parliament. And I therefore welcome the generally collaborative spirit, although unfortunately Douglas Ross made a few political points, but I appreciate there's a, an election uh, coming up that he may have an interest in. Um, call me cynical. Uh, but a general collaborative spirit of today's debate, uh, and I hope that will, will be the tone going forward. And I look forward to working with fellow MSPs, the Scottish Government and the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service to make greater progress on the issues raised in the report and improve our justice system for the benefit of all. Thank you, Mr McPherson. I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by John Finney. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And whilst I'm not involved in any elections uh, this week uh, individually, uh, I, I will make a number of political points as well, because I actually do think uh, that the report has highlighted a number of questions uh, both uh, for the Scottish Government and uh, for the Crown Office. And I think that not to focus in on some of the uh, more negative aspects that the report uh, brought forward uh, would be to do an injustice uh, to the many witnesses who came forward. Uh, and I'd like to, at this point, thank them because what's uh, become very apparent to me uh, through this first major report of the Justice Committee is that it would be impossible to do this kind of work without hearing from the people who face these issues day in, day out. And that's also why it's with sadness I do want uh, to place on the record my disappointment that we didn't get to hear from any of the local proculator fiscals and that even those who had recently left the service were only willing to give evidence under the condition of anonymity. Whilst it might not in fact be the case, it does create a worrying perception that staff felt, or some staff felt, that they'd been gagged, and they certainly weren't comfortable in speaking out because they feared it would bring about disfavour. And that would seem to substantiate some of the other concerns we heard expressed about a top-down culture at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And whilst I recognise uh, that we do have uh, a new Lord Advocate and Crown Agent, and that new directives have been issued, I do think there is still uh, some cause for concern that staff feel that way. Indeed, in, uh, I certainly will. John Finney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edinburgh. Uh, I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. I, I accept that that was a perception you heard. Would the member accept that by speaking with the staff association and the trade unions, we were offered the opportunity to hear some of these concerns raised directly with us? Oliver Mundell. Yeah, I, I fully uh, accept the point that John Finney makes, and it was very helpful 
uh, to hear from those associations. But I think, uh, given some of the issues that I'll come on to cover uh, around the loss of autonomy that a number of uh, fiscals themselves uh, feel has occurred uh, in recent years uh, because of other changes, I do think it would have been helpful uh, to hear from them directly and for the public uh, to be able to watch uh, those evidence sessions and, and make their own uh, judgments of them. And I think some of uh, the issues uh, that people do have uh, in that area come round uh, a, a greater move towards centralisation. The justice system has indeed been transformed, uh, but I'm struggling to see how the justice system has been transformed for the better in some areas. And I think that when we're talking about improving the service, it's impossible to say that closing courts across the country, for example, would, would contribute uh, towards that. And I think it's true uh, that some for some stakeholders, increased centralisation has been well received. Uh, the creation of the National Sexual Crimes Unit in 2009 is a case in point. Uh, and I noted how both uh, Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis felt that this new unit had led to cases being handled uh, better and in a more strategic uh, way and joined up uh, at a policy level with the views and interests of victims being better taken into account. But there's also a less positive side to centralisation and it was concerning to hear that the centralised case marking system had eroded the autonomy of local fiscals. The loss of local decision making has led to many decisions being passed up the chain to senior management and further away. I, for one, am a great believer that justice should be done and seen to be done uh, locally, and there are clear disadvantages to moving away from this. Above all, it means that senior management is now being overworked and it hampers their ability to make effective judgments on cases. And the skills and expertise and professional judgment of the procurator fiscals is being underutilised, which doesn't seem to marry up with the confidence uh, that we have heard the Lord Advocate has in his staff. This has set a very worrying precedent, uh, and as Derek Ogg, QC of the Faculty of Advocates, put it, uh, whilst referring to some specific types of cases, it's a bit like a bow an arrow leaving a bow. Once someone has made a decision somewhere, no one wants to interfere with the decision, and it just rattles on down the track sometimes ending up in court by accident rather than by design. And I do think it is uh, something that is worrying that there are QCs uh, in, our, uh, in our justice system uh, who have significant concerns like that. The move towards centralisation has also created a risk-adverse culture where local fiscals feel they cannot challenge decisions being made from above. And as it states in the report, some local fiscals have felt the need to run cases against their own professional judgment. This is a sad state of affairs, and if it persists, there is potential for public confidence in the justice system to be undermined. Arguably, the work of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service has not been made any easier by new legislation and directives from the Scottish Government. The Victims and Witnesses Act was a landmark for victims and witnesses' uh, rights, and it is a piece of legislation that I very much welcome uh, and has been welcomed by a wide range of stakeholders. However, we cannot deny that the reform has brought about unintended consequences which have caused additional strain on parts of the justice system. And I think what's most disappointing of all is that it was quite predictable that some of those uh, strains and pressures would come about. And it's not clear from some of the evidence that we heard that all the necessary resources were put in place uh, to allow for the smooth introduction of some of these measures. In particular, uh, the Victims Information and Advice Service found its resources being uh, overstretched and limited in the wake of new legislation. In the last seven years, referrals have risen, sh risen sharply by around 45%, and the Thompson Review estimated that there will be an additional 4,000 referrals due to new legislation. I'm concerned there is a perception that the VIA service will struggle to carry out its uh, full range of responsibilities. And indeed, as Victim Support Scotland stated in its evidence, the time and resources of VIA seem to be taken up with the additional administrative work that has resulted from the automatic entitlement to special uh, measure for specific categories of witnesses. 
The result is that uh, many witnesses are not being provided with the measures that they need to support and protect them from the trauma of giving evidence. It's clear that lessons need to be learned and new legislation can only function effectively if it's properly resourced. Going forward, the Scottish Government and indeed this Parliament must be more mindful about what new legislation means in practice and what additional strains it will put on service delivery for a service that is seeing cuts in its budget. Presiding officer, in my closing remarks, I wish to urge some caution against another round of wide-ranging transformational change. The justice system is still in the process of adapting to centralisation and we're still struggling to take many of the key stakeholders along in that process. It's still adjusting to the added pressures of new legislation and directives. To call for more transformational change on top of this would seem unwise. And I'm afraid that sometimes for me, it seems like uh, we hide uh, from the challenges that are faced at the present by promising uh, that they will change in the future. In this day and age, we're taught that change is constant and must always be embraced. But there is a danger that hiding behind the message of transformational change, uh, rather than facing up to the strained resources and negative perceptions that some stakeholders now hold, is holding back the delivery of justice in Scotland. We must remember this. Change is easily uh, promoted, but not necessarily easily delivered. And transformational change does not always transform the fortunes of institutions. And whilst the Crown Office is very good at managing change and embracing change, there was a sense for me uh, throughout this process that uh, change fatigue is starting to kick in. And where changes have happened recently, we must allow more time for them to bed in. Otherwise, how will we know uh, what of those changes have worked and where changes are required in the future. We must uh, put more foresight uh, into how new legislation uh, will be applied and how it will be resourced. Otherwise, how will we an anticipate the unintended consequences of change and the additional, workforce additional workload associated with legislation? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. I call John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I join with colleagues in thanking those who contributed to our report? And I'm pleased we have the Lord Advocate with us present today to, 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 and thank him for his response. Uh, the Justice Committee met this morning. Indeed, we took evidence from the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service on our domestic abuse legislation. This is a law-making building, and should the Scottish Parliament decide to pass it, then there's another load of uh, work that we're sending in the direction of the Lord Advocate and his colleagues. But I took uh, uh, reassurance, if I noted him correctly, the Lord Advocate said, talked about the, the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal uh, Service's ability to absorb and affect change. And everything we heard certainly supported that point of view. Um, so um, I want to talk about the route to that workload and some of the workload, because uh, our report talks about the 225,500 reports that are sent to the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. And of course, we know that these are allocated for marking. There was discussion about central marking, and I will touch on that. Um, um, and it's to look at the option and what some of the consequences of these options are, because of course it could be marked for as no proceedings, so that is if there's um, no crime or an insufficiency of evidence or not in the public interest to proceed. And of course, we do know that there is the opportunity to challenge a decision and not, not to proceed. And I think one of the more interesting discussions from my point of view was a discussion that we had around um, this particular aspect um, on the role and responsibilities of the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. And in particular, the term victim uh, and the term complainer. As a former police officer, I was very familiar with the term complainer. As a politician, I'm conscious that all our um, colleagues from across the parties want to talk quite rightly so about the support for victims. But this did become a feature and um, at uh, paragraph 214 of our report we say the issue is not therefore one merely of terminology but gets to the heart of the CPO of Hess's relationship with victim and witnesses. Um, and we did hear from the Scottish Criminal Bar Association quote that the, the, the service is not the complainer's lawyer and indeed that the pendulum had swung too far. 
to the extent that COPFS is being seen as the victim's lawyer. But what we do know and what our report narrates as well is that uh, COPFS does not give legal advice to victims, it does not accept instructions from victims and does not prosecute on their behalf. The role of the Crown is to act in the public interest um, and uh, the Lord Advocate its prosecution policy and domestic abuse indeed was one area where it was seen to this issue of the victim's lawyer was seen to be played out in practice as our report says that said of course victims say to me i didn't have a lawyer in court um, so uh, there clearly is an issue there um, um, and as our report says at paragraph 216 on the other hand in any effective prosecution system victims and witnesses must feel valued and, and involved and I'd like to quote something else from our re report and that is a, a, a comment from the Scottish Women's Aid who said COPF's role encompasses not only its human rights obligations but all those pose, imposed upon them and the state by the EU directive on the rights of victims in criminal proceedings intended to ensure participation of victims and witnesses and which is incorporated in Scots law and that's done so by the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act. So I think there's a, a complex set of relationships that are to be satisfied and, and of course when a, a case is marked for prosecution and we know that in 2015-16 uh, proceedings were taken against over 116,000 uh, people, then there is a, a decision to be taken as to whether that's solemn and summary procedure. And again, um, th that is, there's been changes with court reform connected with that. Um, we know there's an opportunity, not always taken for an accused, to plead guilty at an early stage, and that can very much shape workload and proceedings. And there are other things like pre-trial hearings to, prepare, um, to determine the state of preparedness of both sides. I think we... Uh, we're aware in, in the course of an inquiry of a lot of these well-meaning proposals which weren't actually always bearing, bearing fruit, but they are to be commended. And we know, of course, that the trial itself can take place uh, over um, several dates. I think choreography was a term that the Crown agent uh, used in relation to all these things coming together. And I want to talk about what would make uh, the, what's required, and this was touched on, of course, by the Lord Advocate, to make the system effective is the role of the citizen and it very clearly is to assist the police in the prevention and detection of crime and to cooperate with the fiscal service and indeed defence lawyers and to participate when required in this process and that means very simply turning up. Uh, I have to say there's nothing new in the non-appearance of accused and witnesses uh, um, uh, but we must have clarity around the citations of witnesses. That's changed over the years and I certainly sat through one trial where there was debate as to whether the individuals had been cited in at, at all. And uh, as someone who doesn't uh, take a, uh, who takes a fairly um, light approach to uh, crime and punishment um, uh, when it comes to sentences, I have to say, I think salutary sentences need to be uh, put in place for those who fail to attend. That dis disturbs our, uh, our, disrupts our entire criminal justice system and brings about this churn. So I, I took some reassurance from the witness scheduler, if again, if I noted that correctly from the Lord Advocate. Um, um, and what I want to, to do now is uh, re reaffirm something that many colleagues have said, and that is about the level of praise we heard for the, the, uh, the service and indeed the professionalism, the de dedication, the hard working. We didn't hear that once, didn't hear it twice. We heard that a number of occasions, and I think that is consistent with my personal experience of dealing as a parliamentarian. And we quote that on the whole, the public should have confidence that it is a rigorous and fair prosecutor. And that's what you want in any liberal democracy. I think that's a, 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 a real endorsement. And of course, we heard that uh, they, they remain under considerable pressure. And, and I have to say, the public sector remains under considerable pressure. And as I say, there's a, a, a growing workload. <coughs> excuse me. Now the, excuse me. The phrase access to justice is, is very much used. And some colleagues have already talked about the term local justice. And this does tie in with uh, understanding communities and priorities in communities. And I have to say, I haven't just heard this in relation to the, the COPFS. I've also heard in relation to police, where they'll say, well, what's maybe not a big issue in the central belt, it's a significant issue in our rural community, particularly if you take something like uh, drug use. So um, I, I think there needs to be awareness of that, and I'm sure in the back of our report that will have been picked up. Um, I'm also keen that um, the, we touched on alternatives to and diversions from prosecution. Um, where that's appropriate um, and what we, we know is that we, we need to have a situation where there's adequate um, alternatives. These alternatives are understood by those dispensing justice or making decisions 
and um, that they have confidence in them. I think uh, there's a list of issues that we talk on the, in the report about which has the potential to disrupt um, um, proceedings and which are out with the COPFS's control. A suspect intimidating witnesses pre-trial. Um, now that's something clearly where we read robust police intervention and the, the question of whether it is appropriate for them to be liberated or not. As someone who's in favour of people, a presumption in favour of liberation, I think we need to understand the implications sometimes of that. We also heard in, um, about the court facilities discouraging witnesses. And that is the case. And we have a lot of um, very old buildings which weren't designed where the consideration of the well-being of witnesses um, wasn't at the forefront of, of uh, people's minds. And I think there are new facilities. For instance, there is to be a new court facility in Inverness. And I know the considerations be given to that and the multi-agency involvement in that. We also heard about d delays in key evidence from other agencies and uh, that's particularly the case with forensic reports. So it's to understand that a case can be held up because of challenges with funding or indeed specialisms in other areas. Um, the question of legal aid is something that has also been uh, mentioned and um, we welcome the fact, the committee indeed welcome the fact that there is to be an independent review of legal aid. Um, and I think that that will address some of the concerns. The question of agreeing evidence in advance is something else that we looked at, minutes of joint agreement. Uh, non -con uh, uncontentious evidence and then of course we, we find out that what one person thinks is uncontentious someone else thinks is contentious so it is perhaps getting some clarity around that. Um, case management is clearly very important and, and our, our port talks about a pilot project running under the authority of the Lord Justice General to streamline a uh, solemn procedure and, and we're advised that that led to more cases being either settled or proceeding to trial earlier. Clearly, if there are opportunities to do that, then that's very much what we'd like to see. I want to touch very briefly, and I'm assuming you'll tell me to stop at the appropriate time, uh, presiding officer, um, the issues of domestic abuse, sexual crimes, and uh, child abuse. I think these are examples where we've seen the very best in the COPFS, where there, there, there's a specialisms have developed, there's co cooperation with um, particularly the police on these matters, and some of the historic cases, I think that's been extremely uh, positive. I have to uh, briefly talk about my own dealings. Um, it, invariably, uh, contact is about things that have gone wrong or have gone wrong in our constituents' point of view. I have to say that the, the engagement has always been positive. It's not always brought the outcome that, that people, uh, the, the, our constituents have wanted, but it's always been very professionally dealt with. Um, the question of plea bargaining is again another issue that, that sometimes comes up in dealing with constituents. Um, but what we also say in the report is a degree of churn is unavoidable fact of life, and that is the reality of the situation. Um, I think um, Ben McPherson talked about the training for, for fiscals, um, and we did hear from two um, fiscals who had left the service who could not speak highly enough about the level of training they had got, and I, I think that is very, very reassuring. Um, we also heard about the Justice Board and the collaborative working that takes place there. And I think if we, we see the role for the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service in issues around witness um, support for witnesses. I think there's a, a lot of good information we came out. I, I, for one, always want to be positive about things. We've heard about a professional and dedicated organisation, and that's how I'd like to finish it. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm noting that when I intend people we've got spare time, there's no difficulty with politicians feeling the space. The challenge now, Mr MacArthur, is yours. I call Liam MacArthur be followed by Stuart Stevenson. We know that Stuart Stevenson can talk for Scotland. That's not an insult. <laughs> uh, Mr MacArthur. I, I'm not sure how much of your generosity is left, but I will try not to uh, abuse it. Uh, Deputy President Officer, can I um, start with an apology to, to you, to MSP colleagues, and to the Lord Advocate, uh, who I congratulate on his debut uh, speech. I have a flight I need to catch back to Orkney this evening, so I won't be able to stay uh, until the very end of the debate. Uh, on a positive note, uh, let me join others in thanking all those who assisted the Justice Committee in the completion uh, of our inquiry into the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. It has taken the best part of a year. It's involved a vast amount of both written and oral evidence and covered the ground, I think, pretty thoroughly. Uh, everyone we heard from helped contribute, but I am particularly grateful to the victims who shared with us uh, their experience of the justice system. 
Their testimony, along with other evidence presented to us, suggested that while improvements have been made and are being made in the support provided for victims and witnesses, gaps do still remain. Provision of support for children and vulnerable witness, uh, witnesses is not yet as consistent as we would like to, um, to see it. And communication and updates on cases can be patchy, absent, and as we heard, even incorrect uh, at times. Uh, this is an area that will require, I think, ongoing attention, uh, not least through the digital strategy, uh, which I will return to later. Since our report was published, however, some stakeholders have expressed to me uh, some surprise that the committee was not more critical uh, in our findings. I think we fairly identified areas where improvement is needed, and many colleagues have rightly touched on that, where the performance of the uh, court and wider justice system still falls short of meeting the needs of victims, witnesses and others. At the same time, though, I think the committee was right to acknowledge the steps that have and are being taken to address some of the concerns that were being raised with us. An example of where I think the work of a parliamentary committee, its ability to shine a light uh, on an issue, can facilitate and at times accelerate uh, action being taken. For that, I think the Lord Advocate and indeed the Crown Agent, who I know is in the chamber uh, this afternoon, uh, deserve credit. They certainly have their work cut out over the coming years to deliver greater efficiency and effectiveness, but they have already, I think, shown a willingness to respond. On staffing, for example, at the outset of our inquiry, there were, uh, frankly, horror stories about um, endless temporary promotions and fixed-term contracts, uh, an apparent revolving door through which skilled and capable staff uh, were being lost to the service, and morale and sickness levels that would have had alarm bells ringing. Uh, to his credit, when confronted with this, the Crown agent didn't seek to duck the criticism uh, of what, to, uh, by any measure, was a flawed and short-termist approach. Um, and in the response from the COPFS uh, to the committee's report, we have seen confirmation of a move towards permanent contracts for existing and new recruits, and I certainly warmly welcome that change of heart. Given the challenges that lie ahead, not least around tightening budgets, ensuring staff are valued and looked after appropriately, I think will be all the more important. Similarly, the concerns many of us had about the centralised marking of cases appear to have registered, at least in part. Uh, there is still work here to be done, local expertise and insight, whether about the individuals or circumstances involved in particular cases, or the alternative to custody that are locally available, need to be fully factored in if justice is to be properly and consistently served across the country. A more regionalised approach to marking does appear to now have been adopted, uh, and I hope that the uh, Lord Advocate and his colleagues will keep this under review over the coming months and years. The final example of where I think we have seen movement over recent months relates to domestic abuse. Differing views were expressed about the impact of the joint protocol, and while all of us agree that a zero-tolerance approach to domestic abuse is essential, there were concerns, heard again in the committee uh, meeting earlier today, that this may have led to uh, effectively zero discretion being available to attending police officers. In his response to our report, the Crown Agent restates quite properly the determination of the service to ensure domestic abuse is, quote, prosecuted robustly, but confirms that a revised fourth protocol was launched in March that underscores that police should only charge and report where there is a sufficiency of evidence. And hopefully this can uh, help address the concerns we heard without giving any succour whatsoever to those who carry out such heinous crimes. Deputy Presiding Officer, before concluding with some observations about churn that, again, a number of colleagues have referred to, let me make a couple of more general comments. In the government's response to our report, uh, the Cabinet Secretary again refers to plummeting crime levels and rates of reoffending. However, as I said in a debate last week, we don't know what the true levels are, for example, of cybercrime. Uh, and it may well be that we're seeing a displacement effect with many crimes simply moving uh, online. In terms of reoffending rates, Scottish Liberal Democrats strongly support greater use of community payback orders and other robust community-based measures, uh, often less costly and more effective than prison sentences. And I urge the Cabinet Secretary, who is hopefully watching from some distant part of the building, uh, to stop prevaricating and act now to introduce a presumption against prison sentences of less than a year, in line with the evidence, in line with independent experts, and in line with the government's own consultation on this issue. As a brief aside, let me also urge um, the Crown Office to look more seriously at the issue of wildlife crime. 
post-prosecution briefings in third to, uh, with third-party stakeholders recommended in the government's 2008 Natural Justice Report are not being fulfilled. The recently dropped prosecution on a raptor poisoning in the Newlands estate bears this out, and that's simply not good enough. On churn, Deputy Presiding Officer, this remains obviously a serious problem for the service and the operation of justice in this country. The reasons for it are many and varied. The solution to it neither simple nor straightforward. However, much does rest on delivery of the government's justice uh, digital strat strategy, which does appear um, to be somewhat delayed. Though, given the problems that uh, we have seen recently in, in a variety of different projects, from farm payments to police uh, IT, an argument can be made for a cautious uh, uh, approach, perhaps under-promising and over-delivering. Um, the evidence and procedure review also lies at the heart of creating a summary uh, criminal justice si system fit for the 21st cen century. With effective digital case management involving all relevant agencies, we should be able to ensure cases focus on the areas of dispute, although I take John Finney's point about whether or not that can be achieved in all instances, and the citation of witnesses uh, on that basis. However that is delivered, we must move away from a process that at present uh, affords too much time, money and emotional uh, energy being wasted, adversely impacting on the experience of victims, of witnesses, the accused uh, and indeed of course of taxpayers. Deputy Presiding Officer, in, in conclusion, there are real strengths in our prosecuting service. Time and again the committee heard that the quality of staff employed across the service is second to none. But the challenges that lie ahead cannot and should not be underestimated. We have seen welcome changes already, but much more is needed in the committee as a role in keeping feet to the fire, and I'm grateful to the convener for confirming that in her opening remarks. I very much look forward to working with her and with committee colleagues in ensuring that we do just that. Uh, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. MacArthur. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr. Stevenson, please. Uh, Presiding officer, in many ways, our prosecution service works in ways similar to those that have worked uh, for centuries, but society and the crimes committed by some in it have changed. I'm currently studying in my spare time the life of John McFeet, who was found guilty of housebreaking and the theft of a coat and a bottle of whiskey on the night of the 22nd to the 23rd August 1830. The court papers show that this 17-year-old young man had left home after falling out with his father, a chair maker at 36 Leith Walk, after he'd refused to give him money for clothes. McFeet stayed in lodgings with some other young people for about a week. The precognitions, 17 of them, show a young man obviously at a loose end and perhaps egged on by his peers. He broke into his father's neighbor's house to obtain drink and stole a coat opportunistically. He and his friends appear to have been larking about on Colton Hill and then retired to their lodgings to consume the whiskey. His trial on the 11th of November 1830 saw 41 jurors summoned. His guilt was quickly determined, perhaps more rapidly than justice today might demand, and he was transported to New South Wales for seven years. He never returned to Scotland. So that's one Scottish crime we've dealt with. The story, of course, could represent similar activities by similarly bored young people today. And the response involving police, fiscal, prosecutor, court, witnesses, and the method of prosecution has changed surprisingly little. But today, there is scrutiny of a different order, and properly so. The focus is more on reform of the criminal, not merely on punishment, and supporting all affected by the crime. So for the Crown Office and the Fiscal Service, there are complexities that were not present in the 1830s. And the arrangements for the accused of access to legal advice are also much wider. As far as I can see, Mr. McFeet had no such advice. Uh, so how are we doing? Number of crimes have fallen to the lowest level in 40 years, and our prosecutors make a substantial contribution to that, alongside police, societal change, prisons, and many others. And at a time of change, the staff in the system feel under pressure. Cases are becoming more complex. There is closer attention to process, to deliver efficiency, inevitably removing what might be thought of as slack time. Such changes are not always welcome. But let me just address the subject of change. Uh, Oliver Mundell argued at some length against change. Let me point him at what is now known as the Hawthorne effect. 
Over an extended period of time, changes were made in one part of a Western electric factory in Cicero, Illinois, in the 1920s and 30s. The other part of the factory remained unchanged. After every single change that was made, productivity rose and absenteeism dropped. At the end of the trials, the factory was returned to its previous state while the researchers considered their findings and productivity rose again. It was concluded that the process of change rather than the nature of the change itself was the source of, the, of benefit to the employee and the company. It's now also described as the observer effect and derived simply from people being taken an interest in. Well-managed change is good. The convener referred to court delays. Unhelpfully, perhaps, she failed to develop all the sources of these, in particular that defence counsel can also come to the court unable to proceed. Like the prosecution, the difficulties can lie with reluctant witnesses. Some parts of the system are startlingly efficient. As a member of a previous Justice Committee, I visited Glasgow Sheriff Court on a Monday. We saw an astonishing 50-plus cases moved on in the course of an hour. Efficient? Very. Effective? Rather less, obviously. There seemed to be no novice offenders, and engaging the whole panoply of the Sheriff Court seemed overkill. So the reform of which we heard during this inquiry was, among other things, focused on making better use of time, and I welcome that. That, in turn, should create more space for preparation by all involved. I welcome, of course, in particular, a planned reduction in use of temporary staff. Uh, Professor Fred P. Brooks posed the question in his book, The Mythical Man Month, how do you make a late project later? The answer is add staff. And the reason is that when new staff arise, there is a cost to the existing staff to integrate them into the team, provide them with knowledge of the local operation and methods, and push them forward to be fully productive members of the team. It's not simply external training. The existing team members carry that burden. So a reduction in staff churn takes two burdens off the system. Less wasted time and integration, and a larger proportion of the time staff spend in the service becomes productive. A further benefit that can be derived can come from staff seeing a task through to its completion. Time taken picking up and putting down items of work is wasted time. Kavina is correct when she points to frustration in delivering improved computer support across the public sector. The London Ambulance Service failure under the Tories in the early 1990s, the SQA computer failures under the Labour and Liberal Democrat administration in the 2000s, and we've had our failures on these benches too. But the private sector can and do find it difficult to make computer changes too. Douglas Ross uh, raised court closures as a source of difficulty. And yet, after the closures, the system appears to be more efficient. Higher throughputs without a corresponding increase in resource being required to achieve them. When we, one moment, while we heard from some deputies that they felt constrained by the existence of a central unit for marking, uh, others pointed out it was not a new process and they did not feel constrained. My apologies, I've moved to another point. Mr Ross. Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, and I uh, welcome the member uh, allowing me to intervene. He said Douglas Ross said X, Y and Z about court closures. Will you accept that I was quoting evidence from the bar associations who were highlighting the impact they are seeing in courts around the northeast of Scotland, uh, in the central belt, that they believe that court closures is having a direct impact on the service we are providing in Scotland. Stuart Stevenson. That's probably a useful clarification, and I accept uh, what the, the, the member says. Uh, however, we did have balancing views as well. Uh, moving on uh, the, the, to, to talking about the central unit, um, I want to just highlight uh, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper of the US Navy, uh, she retired at the age of 80 as the oldest ever regular member of the Navy. She said, act first, apologize later. And she meant, assume you have the power and accept that you'll be held to account as to how you use it until you're told that you don't. Uh, Mr. Ross also rightly spoke of witnesses' frustrations about delays. Uh, for my part, I welcome the program of reform, one of whose outcome must be to serve the interests of all those who contribute to the delivery uh, of justice. 
I served as a juror in the early 1980s in a two-day trial in the Lithgow Sheriff Court of two accused, each facing seven charges. A relatively simple case compared to child abuse, domestic abuse, uh, financial crime. I genuinely wonder how we can help juries make decisions that they will feel more comfortable about in more complex cases. We, of course, took new evidence from jurors because what goes on behind the jury room door is secret. But for the solemn cases, the most serious, the important part of the system. In 1830, George Sutherland, painter glazier, John MacDonald, an innkeeper, John Astley, a chemist, were jurors in John McFeet's trial. And a similar diversity prevails today. Uh, we saw that support for witnesses today far exceeds uh, that given even 20 years ago. Because without witnesses, there can really be no trial. And where once victims could be invisible, we now have support for them. The inquiry has been of value in throwing light on a vital part of our criminal justice system and enabling us in the Justice Committee to hold all responsible for making the system work to account in future. And for my part, I suspect too for others, my understanding has been extended and my preparation uh, for my committee role enhanced. Um, thanks uh, from my part, as uh, others have said, to all who, who are involved in delivering uh, justice in Scotland. While the optimist in me hopes for an end to the need for any criminal justice system, the realist in me knows that we shall continue to depend on it uh, for, to time immemorial. Liam MacArthur made a plea for sentences, uh, to be, no sentences to be under a year. In 1830, no sentences were over a year. If you were guilty of something worthy of incarceration over a year, you were either taken out and hung or you were sent to Australia. I welcome this report. I hope it's a useful contribution to debate. Presiding officer. I was listening. I don't know whether you were advocating that change in penal policy. Uh, I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Mary Evans, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is indeed a pleasure to be able to take part today, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on this debate. Although not a member of the Justice Committee, I am a substitute and as such have had the pleasure of sitting with the Committee on a number of occasions. After months of evidence taking, I was delighted to see the final Committee report after it was published in April 17. I have listened to many valid points by speakers from many facets of the legal profession, and it has soon become clear that although the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is an excellent, rigorous and fair system, in essence, it is beginning to take some strain and cracks are beginning to show. Whilst I agree with the inquiry that on the whole, the public should have confidence in the COPS being a rigorous and fair prosecutor, I have serious concerns about the direction the service is going and the future. As we already heard from the convener, Margaret Mitchell, in her opening, the review was long overdue. Much evidence has been received Evidence from the coalface that showed low morale. Short-term contracts were too much in evidence and staff resilience was that breaking point. These deputy presiding officers are not a good position for any service to find themselves in. And my colleague Douglas Ross, opening for the Conservatives, talked about the professionalism of the staff and also about supporting victims in a key way of moving forward. But these victims must have confidence in the system and it has to be acknowledged that the SNP government decided to cut the budget for the services. But if standards are to improve, extra resources and extra training is required to ensure that we can all benefit going forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, past evidence of the committee has led the inquiry to focus on a number of very valid concerns. The centralisation of the service, the efficiency and effectiveness of the service, the role of the inspectorate and the treatment of victims, witnesses and the accused. Serious concerns were raised about the resources of the CPOS as well. Deputy Presiding Officer, although it is difficult to benchmark the CPOS against anyone else, because we only have the one prosecution service here, it can be directly compared. It is clear that we have already seen with Police Scotland and also the concerns about proposed changes to transport policing. And although very welcome by some, the centralisation of the CPOS has produced considerable financial and operational strains. 
and many consider that this process has gone too far. And I would allay myself with some of these comments. As the committee has found, staff are overworked, funding has declined, and demands on the service continue to grow. The service is just about managing. Its communications has been classified as poor, under prioritising standards of summary cases, and it seems to be ill-equipped to deal with specialist prosecutions. We must recognise all of these facts at the present time, because if we are to see improvements, they must be challenged and they must be progressed. The last major report of the CPRS was back in 2003, where concerns were raised then about underfunding. Deputy Presiding Officer, in the coming year, 1718, the real term, the COP budget has been cut. Indeed, the Crown agent said that 750,000 of efficiency savings would have to be met by staff budget, which equates to about 30 jobs. The loss of that talent and that experience may never be replaced. However, in order to deliver the real term savings, which is expected to be required over the next five years, the forecast may be that it's closer to 200 that may be required uh, to lose uh, a role uh, in the organisation. The Lord Advocate asks the committee to consider the need to widen transformation change, while stating that cutting resources was not the only way to solve the problem. That may, however, be the committee's case, but when we look at the over-resilience on digital solutions and delivering of that, uh, we cannot rely uh, on digital solutions to deliver an effective service. That may be taking it too far. It is a difficult situation, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it is clear the service is already struggling and can ill afford to suffer further financial restrictions. The committee has accepted that delays in infrastructure and efficiencies cannot be solved by the CPOS itself. There have to be others who play the part. The government has to take a role. The judiciary have to take a role. The whole organisation must look at it. And Audit Scotland have estimated that the adjournment of delays of cases has cost around £10 million. Deputy Presiding Officer, we see from today that there is a consensus about the professionalism and the way that the system has worked, and it is working. But there needs to be thought, serious thought, about how it can be managed. Victims have to be, feel secure and confident in the system. The judiciary have to feel that they have the rights and the responsibilities to manage effectively. And we as parliamentarians have a role to play in that whole process, if there is to be scrutiny and there is to be governance of the whole process going forward. It's vitally important that we all play our part, that we make the picture complete, and we ensure that we put all our efforts into managing the process for the people of Scotland who deserve the service to be efficient and effective. So in concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, I say today that there are real concerns about the centralisation and decision-making uh, and that poor job satisfaction and staff morale must be thought about, must be managed and must be understood. A more risk-averse culture is growing and local offices are having to run cases uh, against their own professional judgment. That can no longer be continued or allowed to continue. The service must become effective, must become efficient and must become... Uh, reorganised. We understand that, but protecting the service from further cuts, further resources, funding, headcount and infrastructure are vitally important to ensure that we get the best we can and we can have the confidence in the service moving forward. I commend the committee on their work so far and the report. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I call Mary Evans to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a real pleasure to speak about the report into the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in the debate today, the culmination of five months of work of the Justice Committee. Uh, because being new to the committee, it was an absolutely fascinating piece of work and it gave a real insight into the criminal justice system in Scotland. And I would like to add my thanks to those uh, expressed by others in the chamber today, to all of those who provided both oral and written evidence to the committee, um, and as well as to all the clerks for the absolute power of work that they put in. And I also have to give some recognition to the members in the chamber today who perhaps didn't sit on the Justice Committee but have taken part in this debate and had to plough through that report and all of the evidence because that's by no means an easy task. 
But one thing was clear in the evidence that we heard, and that is that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is regarded as a hard-working, professional, rigorous and fair prosecutor of crimes in Scotland. But while the over overall impression was that it did a good job within its resources, there were also areas which could still be developed, uh, particularly in relation to the service it provides for victims, and it's that area which I would like to focus on today. Now, central to the COPFS strategy for victim, victims and witnesses has been the creation of the Victim Information and Advice, uh, and Advice Service, which we've heard touched on by other members today. Now, since it was piloted in 2001, the service has been rolled out across Scotland, and today its remit has grown to serve victims in a variety of serious cases, including domestic abuse, racial aggravation, cases involving children and victims of sexual offences. But as its remit has grown, so too have the demands on the VIA service. As Oliver Mundell mentioned earlier, uh, from the period from 2006 to 2015, there was an increase in referrals of 45% to the service, from 27,500 referrals in 2006 to 40,000 referrals of people seeking information and advice. But there is, however, a disconnect between prosecution and victims. While it is recognised that COPFS is not the victim's lawyer, the COPFS itself accepts that there is a gap between the service which can be provided and the service which they would like to see victims receive from the system as a whole. And while we can recognise how far the system has evolved since its inception, the review of victim care in the justice sector in Scotland by Dr Leslie Thompson QC, which we, we've also heard about today, states that we should be in no doubt that the experience for many victims can be of a system which does not recognise or accommodate their needs. Now, the Thompson Review is a, a vitally important review we heard about, we heard much of in our evidence. Throughout the evidence gathering stage, we heard from victims who had the impression that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service staff were working under extreme pressure and that there was a lack of personal attention. But the most powerful evidence we heard was from victims of domestic abuse themselves, who told us directly of the, uh, the victim that I spoke to personally and that the members in my group heard from. Uh, she told us directly of the harrowing experience she had been through from the crimes committed against her through to the prosecution of those crimes. She told us of how the experience of going through the justice system had re-traumatised her and left her questioning whether it had been worth going through it at all. And one of the worst things about it was when she told us that she would have rather taken another beating than go through the process again. And I think if that's the experience of the people going through our justice system, then more has to be done. Now, communication was raised as a key issue between the prosecution service and victims and witnesses. The Thompson Review stated that there is a strong desire amongst victims for a single source of support and information, eliminating or reducing the need to approach numerous agencies at different stages. And the evidence we heard bore that out. Victims often have to approach multiple agencies for assistance, and the amount of information provided by those agencies concerned, such as the Crown Office and the VIA, uh, particularly at the outset of a case, can be overwhelming. Victims have access to the Victims Code for Scotland, the Working Together for Victims and Witnesses Protocol, and the Access to Information Protocol. But while all of these are packed with informa information, you can only imagine how confusing that is for someone at a time, if you're a victim, that you're trying to deal with the trauma of what you've been through, let alone take in all that information and process it. At the conclusion of a case, victims are approached by multi multiple agencies again, uh, sometimes being contacted by three separate organisations on the same day, each essentially providing the same information, albeit for different purposes. This includes being contacted again by VIA, by Police Scotland, as well as other support agencies. An approach which can confuse, inconvenience and again overwhelm a victim who then has to relive that incident however many times in one day. The Thompson Review examined other approaches from different countries which we might like to learn from here. New York, for instance, has the Witness Aid Services Unit, which combines four services under one roof, which supports victims by liaising with the criminal justice system, the notification de department, which keeps the victim up to date on the progress of the case, and the social services department and a counselling service for the victim. 
Another example that we can look to learn from is the victim information counter at The Hague, where there is co cooperation between the public prosecution service, victim support, the police and the criminal injuries compensation fund. Bo both of these systems allow a single point of entry to seek information and assistance on the issues that a victim might face. And from our evidence, that became clear. We need that one-stop shop approach to give victims that one direct contact for the information and the advice that they need. Now, there were so many other important elements that were raised during our inquiry and probably far too many for all of us to go into, go into, into detail today. But an, another area I just want to touch on briefly before I close today, and one which I feel is vitally important, is that of wildlife crime, which I was glad to hear Liam MacArthur raise earlier. Now, prosecution rates for reported wildlife crime are very low, uh, around 10 to 15 per cent of reported cases. And while I know that cases of wildlife crime can be hard to prosecute because of the lack of evidence in some cases, there was a frustration and disappointment expressed by Scottish Environment Link in the evidence that they gave to the committee that a recommendation from the Natural Justice Report in 2008, uh, which asked that following the completion of any significant criminal case concerning environmental wildlife crime, there should be a full debrief involving the police, the Crown Office and other relevant bodies, including third sector organisations such as the RS SPB, and that recommendations like that were still waiting to be implemented. So I hope that that will be taken on board today and that we will get a response to that. Now, we've seen recently some very high profile instances of wildlife crime going unprosecuted, most notably the shooting of a hen harrier in the Cabrach estate in Murray, a case which was recently dropped after prolonged investigation and the setting of an illegal pole trap in the Angus Glens, cases which have ignited huge public interest. I'm the species champion for the hen harrier, a species which has been in severe decline in Scotland. Now, these crimes are serious, and I welcome the outcome of the review into satellite-tagged eagles, which was commissioned by the Scottish Government and published last week, because we need to be doing more to protect our wildlife and to ensure that those who commit crimes against wildlife and against our native species do not escape the punishment that they deserve. Now, to conclude, the current system we have it is it's complicated and it can be overwhelming for vi victims and witnesses alike. There is a need for a simplification and a coordination of the provision of information relating to individuals' cases, providing that one-stop shop for those affected. There are working models out there that we can learn from, such as those I mentioned in New York and the Netherlands. But we owe it to the victims and witnesses to give them a system that does recognise and accommodate their needs, wherever they are in Scotland. Thank you. I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Fulton McGregor. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, let me begin by referring members to my entry in the Register of Interests as a self-employed advocate and member of the Faculty of Advocates. Um, and indeed, in that capacity, prior to being elected as an MSP, I have prosecuted both in the High Court and in the Sheriff Court, and indeed defended cases in both of these. Uh, it goes, of course, without saying that in doing that, I did have contact and work with both the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Services. So, the recommendations of the Justice Committee report are of particular interest to me, and I do appreciate the stresses and strains that people work under that do such excellent work in the prosecution services. Now, as an MSP, of course, I have the opportunity to see things from a slightly different angle. I have had constituent contact uh, from constituents regarding their experiences of the court system uh, since becoming an MSP, and some of these experiences certainly seem to be reflected well in the recommendations made by the report, uh, which details improvements that need to be made. It is vital that members of the public have every confidence in the justice system in Scotland. They need to know that if they ever need to report a matter, they will be treated appropriately and professionally. This is, of course, not to cloud the role that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service plays. As was said in evidence on behalf of the Faculty of Advocates, the prosecutor is not there to represent the victim to get the case limping into court under any circumstances. The committee recognized that often this can lead to difficult decisions being made and that victims can sometimes find painful. But as the report of the committee found, this is 
a necessary element to protect the independence and integrity of the prosecution service. Nevertheless, it is important that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service treats all involved in cases presented to it, both wit victims and witnesses, properly and appropriately, and that these people receive the information they need, however the service decides to treat the case that it is presented with. And this applies especially to young people. Now, the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 is meant to ensure implementation of this, establishing a victim's code and victim information and advice service that we've heard about in other speeches already. Uh, as we know, of course, some elements of that are still being brought into force, and it may be some time before its full usefulness can be demonstrated. Certainly, this is an issue that I've come across as an MSP, where vulnerable victims of crime who should have been referred to the uh, BIA service have apparently not been, leaving them without any knowledge of the progress of a case, perhaps until it was too late for any meaningful input by them. And that resonates with the evidence given in committee that there are some or have been some serious failings involving the service, including a lack of communication and uh, indeed uh, information which might be called misinformation in a general sense. Experiences like these can damage trust with the public and it is vital that the principles and rights set out in the 2014 Act are met and adhered to for the sake of victims. They should not be left in a position where they regret having reported a crime in the first place. Now my colleague Oliver Mundell very eloquently outlined uh, a whole number of his very real concerns about a wide number of matters, and I'm not going to repeat those here. Um, but I think one matter which has been raised by others is the question of the internal stresses within the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And these must be addressed. Because at the same time as the rights and services that victims and witnesses can expect from the justice system having been stepped up, the services budget has been cut, as we have already heard, by four million pounds in this financial year to 109 and a half million pounds. If we add to this the fact that other demands on the service are changing, including changing profile of crimes, the pace and degree of legal reform and technological changes, it is clear to see that the service's staff are under some significant pressure. The committee report, for example, told us that communications and relationship building with victims and witnesses isn't always working as it ought. The Edinburgh Bar Association summed up the situation describing the situation as being one of the organization struggling manfully in difficult circumstances and referring to understaffing as a consequence of some of the cuts. And indeed, Scottish Conservative research from earlier this year also showed a rise in sick days for Crown Office staff of something like 20% over the last six years. Now, that is a worrying trend that may reflect some of the pressures that staff are facing and having to deal with. And it is difficult to see how further job losses can be sustainable if the current level of service delivery is to be maintained and in some areas which we know needs to be improved. So Deputy Presiding Officer, I will conclude by saying that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service faces a challenging time ahead. Whilst I've pointed to victim and witness communication, pressures also impact on decision making and relationships between criminal justice stakeholders. And I would hope that the government takes into account the concerns that have been expressed through this report and indeed in this debate and realizes the impact that further cuts in funding could have for an, in some areas, already struggling service. And the last of the open debate speeches is Philip McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate on the Justice Committee inquiry. As others have said, this was a large and ambitious inquiry that involved commitment from all members. And um, given that I have decided to return from maternity leave uh, just half a day early today 
to be involved in this debate, given the time commitment that all members uh, put into this. I would also like to just um, start by apologising to the convener um, for not being here for her opening uh, remarks. It's absolutely no reflection on, uh, on her leadership of the committee. In fact, I think that she's uh, led it uh, very well through this inquiry. Um, like others have said, I think it almost everybody said, I'd like to thank all those who, who gave evidence. I found the evidence sessions uh, and site visits to be very interesting and informative. And I would also like to thank everyone who gave their time to provide the information that we have required in coming to the conclusions set out in the report. Clearly, the continued austerity from Westminster has had a massive effect on the budget and spending decisions of the Scottish Government and any government funded organisation is going to be impacted by these decisions. And I was, uh, well, if you let me continue, please. Um, I, I welcome uh, Alexander Stewart's um, comments uh, and passion he spoke with about protecting the service. And I hope that uh, if his party get the result that's, uh, that's widely predicted on Thursday, he will speak to his colleagues in London about doing just that in terms of the austerity agenda. And the prosecution service, I totally agree, is a vital public service, and I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has protected its budget and cash terms. And it's also important to note that the Lord Advocate, eh, as others have said, has described the budget as a, a settlement that enables me, in, in his words, eh, in the forthcoming financial year to fulfil my public responsibilities. Now, moving on, eh, presiding officer, as some members know, before my election, I worked as a, a social worker, and the, the latter four years was in the criminal justice sector, preparing reports for court and supervising community payback orders. And maybe, as uh, so bold to suggest, I maybe played a small part in that small corner of Lanarkshire in helping to reduce the, the re-offending that others have talked about and the recorded crime levels in Scotland. But on a serious note, um, the, the vast amount covered by uh, this inquiry, um, I would like to spend my time talking about uh, areas of specific interest to me from my my previous employment. Um, one such area is that of uh, domestic violence, and uh, this government has committed to bringing in new legislation to tackle this issue uh, head on. I know that most people across the chamber and across all the, the various parties are in agreement with this and pleased with the steps taken. And the committee did uh, hear differing evidence with some witnesses uh, suggesting that such cases were being pursued, without, uh, pursued as a priority without considering the public interest. However, I was pleased to hear evidence from Rachel Weir, for example, eh, who said that no case would be prosecuted unless there was evidence to do so. And I felt that was eh, really reassuring for the committee. Eh, and eh, the Lord Advocate himself also backed it up when he informed the committee that conviction rates eh, for domestic abuse cases were around 80%, therefore suggesting that um, prosecutions were on steady ground. But perhaps the most important issue um, around this area and where I would wholeheartedly agree eh, with Claire Baker when she spoke very eloquently on this earlier, is that we do need to take on this behaviour that has plighted our society and been hidden in silence for, for so long. So I, I'm pleased that the committee has recognised this in its conclusions. And we heard evidence from victims, as uh, Mary Evans, for example, spoke about, and their experience of criminal proceedings. And that was very, very powerful um, for us all to hear in, in those uh, private evidence sessions. Uh, and I hope that the Lord Advocate um, will be able to reflect on some of the information that came back from those, um, those information sessions about in terms of how uh, witnesses uh, and victims of uh, domestic violence felt that their experience of the, the court and criminal proceedings uh, went from then on in. Presiding officer, another area I was interested to hear more about uh, through the inquiry was the advancement of some aspects of the digital strategy. And I believe that this will be an important tool going forward for the courts it will or, or should reduce the time and resources required at various stages. If, for instance, an individual on remand or already serving a sentence in custody is able to appear by video link eh, rather than being transported to the court, held in the holding area for a period of time before appearing briefly, eh, then to be transported back to the prison. In terms of witnesses, it could also eh, be very much eh, assistance in a variety of situations, including those of a domestic nature, eh, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago. Eh, I think that some of the witnesses um, that we spoke to, they maybe, maybe would have been able to benefit from um, video link being in place uh, had that been around at that time. And of course, when dealing with vulnerable young people, I'd like to make mention of the part of the report around children giving evidence in court. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, this can have a long-term negative effect on a child, the whole experience of doing that. And I was pleased to hear from the Cabinet Secretary uh, 
that there was compelling evidence to keep children away from courtrooms and that developing a new way of capturing evidence from children and vulnerable people is a priority for this government. And I look forward to this being uh, introduced uh, in due course. And there's also the issue of bail and remand and evidence was heard that decisions uh, can often be made uh, without full evidence uh, being available. Families outside, uh, for example, stated that they did not believe that sufficient consideration was often given to children who don't necessarily differentiate between remand and custody. Uh, for them, that their parent is in jail and all the, the stigma and consequences that, that comes with that uh, are, are there for them to deal with. Um, so that's perhaps something else that, that, that we can, um, the Lord Advocate and the Prosecution Service could look at. And this brings me to my final point, uh, President Officer, I'd like to touch on the issue of the committee heard about the centralisation, um, for example, of uh, case marking. Uh, as a former worker in the field, as I mentioned, it does feel to me personally like we have maybe lost something uh, in that area, that, that ability to pick up the, the phone and talk to someone about our local resources, uh, such as diversion schemes that may be appropriate in certain situations. And we heard some witnesses uh, say this to the committee, but I wonder myself if this is just antidotal, because we also... Um, heard uh, evidence that the centralisation has led to a more efficient system. So I, I think um, concluding on this, it was an area I was, I was very interested in as the inquiry was ongoing. I think it might be too early to say, uh, and I welcome the committee recommendation asking for the COPFS to continue to monitor this as appropriate, uh, which I'm sure will happen, uh, you know, and, and the Lord Advocate may uh, take forward. In conclusion, President Officer, I'd like to thank all of those, who, as others have done, who work in our justice system, eh, from the police to the prosecutors, eh, sheriffs and judges. Um, I, obviously, I think it goes without saying, to keep up the good work, ensuring everyone in Scotland eh, can be continued to be proud of our independent justice system. And I would like to thank again the, all members of the committee, the convener and the clerks, for helping to ensure a very thorough inquiry. Thanks very much. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the, the Justice Committee, can I thank everyone who has contributed to this very important inquiry. From the witnesses who came to the committee, those who provided written evidence or gave private testimony, and those who we met on our committee visits. Your very valuable input has helped to shape the report that we have debated um, today in the Chamber. And can I also take this opportunity to thank the, the, the clerking team that, that support the committee. Um, the support and help that they have given us, I think, cannot be um, underestimated. Presiding Officer, in its first major inquiry this parliamentary session, the Justice Committee has delved into an area of our criminal justice system that has been long overdue a parliamentary assessment. And the report, the inquiry into the role and purpose of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, should serve as a guide to the Cabinet Secretary, the Scottish Government, the Crown Agent and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And the very detailed recommendations that have been made by the committee have been made in the sincere wish that we can provide a criminal justice service that meets the needs of victims and witnesses whilst balancing the rights of the accused in order to deliver a criminal justice system that works for Scotland. And, presiding officer, a recurring theme that appears throughout the report is the disconnect of the experiences, the expectations and the realities of those at the strategic level of the COPFS and those on the front line. And speeches from across the chamber this afternoon have reflected this, as well as staffing and resourcing pressures, and the experiences of vulnerable witnesses. Churn and witness citations have also featured in a number of speeches today. And I was particularly pleased to hear the Lord Advocate in his remarks earlier today acknowledge many of the concerns and recommendations that are in the report and his commitment to deliver change in the COPFS and build on not only our recommendations but also the very strong recommendations in the Thompson Review. And in my closing remarks, I'd like to pick up on two key aspects of the report. And the first covers staffing and resources. And the COPFS has not escaped budget cuts in the last 10 years. Evidence provided during the inquiry 
shows that while the budget has remained static, the real terms cut of 21.5% has had a real impact on the delivery of the COPFS. And despite the general trend of reported crime falling over the last 20 years, cases ending in court have increased. And coupled with the loss of staff and resources to the COPFS, evidence shows this to be an organisation struggling manfully in difficult circumstances. And these are not my words, but those of the Edinburgh Bar Association, who further added, the problem that displays itself in every department is understaffing. We heard from unions representing COPFS staff that targets are being met, but at a high cost to those working within the Crown Office. The workload increases, while preparation time decreases. This is not good for staff, and above all else, it's not beneficial to the accused, to the victim, or to the witnesses. And the evidence tells us that the effectiveness and the efficiency of the COPFS is being hampered by cuts to staffing and to resources. And with an increase in cases, many involving complex and demanding needs due to a variety of different factors, it is essential that the Crown Office protects the workforce from further cuts. And in his response the, the, to the committee report, David Harvey, the Crown agent, informs us that the organisation has made significant progress in strengthening our staffing position and that sickness absence is reducing. However, Mr Harvey also adds, we anticipate we will not be able to deliver all the savings required through non-staff costs and that any staff who leave voluntarily will not be replaced. And these contradictory statements made by Mr Harvey do raise a concern that there could be an impact in the future for the effectiveness, the efficiency and the image of the COPFS. And the second key area I wish to cover is support for victims and witnesses, in particular vulnerable witnesses. And we heard during the evidence sessions a lot of praise for the staff of the Victim Information and Advice Service and their willingness to go the extra mile. The staff, as my colleague Claire Baker pointed out in her opening remarks, are dedicated professionals and they deserve our support and our financial backing. However, the duty of care road to victims and witnesses often fell short, according to some evidence. We heard of one charity representing victims of domestic crime. We said that those they asked said they were traumatised by the experience. And ensuring that protections that have been offered to witnesses are indeed delivered should be a priority for the COPFS and for the wider criminal justice system. And the third sector plays a vital role in supporting victims and witnesses during and after the court process. And we must continue to strengthen the collaborative approach between the COPFS, the VIA service and the third sector. And finally, it's clear from the inquiry that the COPFS has a problem in communicating with witnesses, with victims and other criminal justice stakeholders. And it's also clear that many of the problems causing backlogs and churn and the overall perception of an organisation struggling are linked to its communication. And the Scottish Government must ensure that everyone involved in the criminal justice process, whether it's Police Scotland, the COPFS, the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service and other stakeholders, work in a much more collaborative way to achieve the outcomes that are desired for victims and for witnesses and for the COPFS staff while balancing the rights of the accused. And finally, presiding officer, can I end my contribution today by thanking the staff of the COPFS for the hard work and dedication they show on a daily basis, often under difficult and stressful circumstances. Thank you. Call Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by referring to my register of interest as a practicing member of the Faculty of Advocates. 
I'd like to start by picking up a point made by Claire Baker. Um, despite the fact that this is a committee debate, and despite the fact that the Lord Advocate is, of course, responsible for the prosecution service, it does seem a great shame that the Cabinet Secretary for Justice is not here. Um, while the Lord Advocate is a cab Cabinet member, he is a minister, he is a member of the, this Parliament, there are political points which require to be addressed. And the Lord Advocate is, of course, politically uh, non-aligned. Uh, we've had debates about budget, uh, and members have also spoken about much wider criminal justice issues. But moving on from that, I am pleased to be able to close this debate for the Scottish Conservatives today, and would like to begin, like others, by paying tribute to the staff who work not only for the Crown Office, but also those who work across Scotland's many uh, procurator fiscal offices. Staff who work in this service dedicate long hours, and unlike other public sector staff, often don't get thanked for their effort uh, and commitment. The nature of their work is sensitive, and decisions taken by the Crown Office uh, and Procurator Fiscal Service can plainly have life-changing consequences for many people. Notwithstanding all that, it is important that even bodies such as this undergo regular review to ensure that they are fit to deal with the challenges of both the present and the future. And as the report notes, it has been almost 15 years since the last major review into the COPFS. And it's fair to say that much has changed in the legal and political landscape since then. My own professional experience of the Crown Office is limited and some time ago now, but one of the first instructions that a newly qualified advocate could get would be a stint as the Crown Junior, that is, Junior Counsel for the Prosecution in cases in the High Court. And it was an excellent experience for me watching and learning from practitioners of criminal law as they applied their trade, including acting as a junior to the Lord Advocate himself. However, it also gave me an insight into the pressures facing the service. And even 10 years ago, I can well remember the Crown Agent's room in the High Court in Glasgow with a small number of staff trying to administer a large number of cases. And this was so even in the wake of the Bonamy reforms, which were meant to streamline and rationalise the court side of the, of the criminal process. And I have to say, I do have an abiding sense of the Crown Office firefighting with all the attendant pressures of time, of public scrutiny, and of limited star available staff. Now that's perhaps an unfair anecdotal reflection on how things were 10 years or so ago, but it is striking uh, the committee hints at similar problems still facing the service today. And the report has identified various issues that point to uh, pressure. The projected 30 job losses this year with an estimated 200 job losses over the next five years. It also talks about the general trend towards a more centralized prosecution service which is perceived as having led to a lowering of morale and job satisfaction in local fiscal offices. As Oliver Mandel pointed out, there are pros and cons to this particular centralisation, but it's particularly pertinent to me representing a large rural area such as the Highlands and Islands. Um, and I think we're all concerned across the chamber that it would be hugely detrimental if local knowledge and expertise suffered at the expense of a centralised system, given the sheer geography of Scotland and the fact that effective local fiscal offices, often serving local sheriff courts, are key to the smooth running of the system on the ground. The report refers to the fact that the burden of cases on staff has significantly increased, and that there is a perception that it's become close to impossible for fiscals to adequately prepare all their allocated cases within their contracted hours. This tallies with um, anecdotal evidence I've heard in relation to advocate deputies in the High Court when preparing for trial, because it seems the pre-trial period is where the real pressure lies. An advocate deputy can have 10 to 12 preliminary hearing cases to prepare, occasioning approximately two weeks preparation and then two weeks of the hearings themselves to get through all those cases. Those cases can be weighty, they can involve social work, education and medical records which have to be considered. And as the Lord Advocate will know, the court expects the case to be ready for trial, for the trial to start at any stage after the preliminary hearing, so the preparation has to be front-loaded. And if an advocate deputy gets held up in a trial, the prep time disappears, and that is when the real stress happens. Um, the fact that the overall perception from witnesses is that the service is just about managing, and that is concerning, and there are questions over the adequacy of resources. Well, all that should shake us into action. Now, there have been many interesting observations in, in the chamber this afternoon. I want to highlight some of them. Margaret Mitchell, the convener, spoke about how she wants to keep a watching brief on this. And I can't imagine it will be another 15 years uh, before um, we return to this subject. 
Ben McPherson um, made various comments, and I was struck by his remarks about the significance of local justice and the prosecution of crime in his constituency here in Edinburgh, just as Gordon Lindhurst spoke of cases coming to him as an MSP uh, where the person had been a victim uh, uh, through, coming through the system. Douglas Ross made criticism, but constructive and not overtly political. Um, there are problems which ultimately the Scottish Government has to address, and the budget is plainly one of them. Oliver Mundell, in a typically measured contribution, um, spoke about not rushing into another bout of radical change. And I take issue with Stuart Stevenson. He didn't argue against change per se. What he said was more subtle. He said that change for change's sake uh, is unwarranted. John Finney drew on his long experience in policing and involvement as a parliamentarian in justice issues. And he noted that the evidence repeatedly before the committee was a concentrated on staff commitment and the fact that the system in principle is a rigorous one. Um, Mari Evans and Mary Fee spoke um, very powerfully about the effect of being a victim and a witness in the system and the demands that are rising on, on the VIA service and the, the still uh, existing disconnect between prosecutor and victim. And going back to my own experience, I recall very awkward conversations after a trial, um, going to meet a, a witness and the prosecutor having to act as a sort of hybrid support worker, a lawyer, a guide to, to a victim who, who may have been distraught um, following the result of, of, of a trial, be that an acquittal or a conviction. Um, in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, this shouldn't be seen as a single party issue, but plainly as a cross party effort to ensure the service is fit for present and future challenges. And overall, the report provides us with a lot of positive feedback that we should be mindful of. However, it also lays out recommendations that need to be taken further in order to improve the effectiveness of this service so that when Parliament next reports, the COPFS gets a clean bill of health. Thank you. I call on James Wolfe. Thank you, Deputy <coughs> Presiding Officer. Um, can, can I thank all the members who've contributed to uh, the debate uh, today? Um, they have made a variety of important points. Um, and like the inquiry process and the committee's report, uh, provide a great deal of uh, material for myself and for the leadership of the service to reflect on uh, as we uh, take the service forward to the next period of its uh, history. And I'd like to thank the members who've praise the work of the prosecutors who up and down Scotland prosecute in the public interest on my behalf. I'd like to touch, if I may, on one or two of the matters that have been raised in the course of the debate. Uh, and I'll try and focus on areas that I didn't deal with in, in my opening remarks. Let me first deal with the issue of centralization specialization and prosecutorial judgment. Uh, and I'd like to separate out a number of different uh, issues. Uh, the first is the question of prosecutorial judgment. Uh, I've made clear from the outset the trust and confidence that I have in those who prosecute crime in Scotland. That's not to say that they can exercise um, uh, some sort of free-floating discretion. They have a responsibility to apply the law and to apply my prosecution policy to the cases that come before them. That's part of making sure that we treat like cases uh, alike. But I rely on the judgment and professional expertise of individual prosecutors uh, to apply the law and to pro apply prosecution policy to the individual cases uh, that come before them. Uh, and I have made clear in the past and make clear again uh, the confidence that I have in their professional skill and judgment. But it's not just me saying that. The service, through the prosecution policy review, which it, it is being undertaken, um, and through steps taken to change the approval levels uh, within the service, is taking concrete steps to return decision making to frontline prosecutors. And I should make clear that I do not detect 
as I speak to prosecutors, uh, any loss of morale. In my experience, uh, prosecutors uh, have an enormous sense of professional pride in the work that they do and in the service of which they uh, form part. And um, Ben McPherson referred to the civil service survey from last year. Um, it was heartening to see in that uh, a number of favorable uh, figures. To the question, I have the skills I need to do my job effectively, 92% positive, up 4% from, from the previous year. I have the tools I need to do my job effectively, 70% uh, up 9% from the previous year. I have an acceptable workload, 56% up 15% from the previous year. I achieve a good balance between my work life and my private life, 67% up 11% from the previous year. So without for, for a moment being complacent and without for a moment um, uh, uh, failing to recognize the challenges to which the committee has uh, alluded, uh, I'm confident uh, in the staff uh, and in the um, expertise and skill uh, of the staff of, of the fiscal service. There is a separate point about centralization and specialization. Because the service is a national service, it can establish specialist units so that we can establish, respond effectively and consistently to particular categories of criminality. And we've heard the creation and the work of the specialist units of Crown Office, for example, in the area of sexual crime, um, uh, being welcomed uh, both in the committee's report uh, and in the chamber uh, today. That doesn't mean, uh, and, and perhaps I should include in the specialist units, the national initial case marking uh, centers. Um, we mark cases. I, I, I will, certainly. Mary Fee. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the, the specific concerns that was raised in relation to um, central marking was the loss of local knowledge when it came to marking up cases. Do you accept that that is a legitimate concern? And if you do, how will that be overcome? James Wolfe. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it's a concern which has been expressed. The national case marking system is able to accommodate uh, local knowledge. It's organised so that staff deal with particular uh, 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 sheriffdoms and can therefore develop an expertise in the particular circumstances in local areas. There is nothing which can prevent, um, or nothing to prevent police in the reports that they uh, file referencing particular issues in particular local areas. Um, and so I don't accept that um, the marking of cases in a national centre means that prosecutors cannot take into account uh, uh, local circumstances. Uh, indeed, it makes sure that we can um, uh, bring to bear information about particular circumstances in a consistent way. There was a point that Liam MacArthur, who's not here, made during the committee hearing when he talked about um, uh, sort of consistent variability and um, approaching the marking of cases on a national basis allows us, allows us to do that. But I understand the concerns that have been expressed and I have no doubt that the service will wish to keep under review the arrangements that, 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 that we make. Uh, but I make no apology for approaching uh, the work of the service on a national basis, um, a, a, a national uh, which um, ensures that we apply like standards to criminality across the country. If I touch on the subject of domestic abuse, um, I'm grateful to the contributions to this debate on that subject. I, I make no apology for the rigorous approach which I take to domestic abuse, um, an approach which is outlined in the joint protocol between COPFS and Police Scotland. It is a necessary corrective to historic attitudes to that form of criminality. Um, as has been mentioned in the course of the debate, 
a new edition of the protocol was launched in March, which provides new guidance in relation to a number of matters. It emphasizes if emphasis is needed that the police should only charge and report an accused where there is sufficient evidence. And it provides new guidance on the use of undertakings as an alternative to custody in appropriate cases. But it reinforces, and I make no apology for reinforcing, the strong presumption in favor of prosecution and the firm and rigorous approach which prosecutors are expected to take to this uh, form of criminality. Um, I do not accept that the focus, the particular rigorous approach we take to this form of criminality uh, has affected in an adverse way uh, the way that the service handles all forms of criminality. The service is committed to being an effective, rigorous, fair and independent prosecutor in relation to all forms of, of criminality uh, and it will continue uh, to do that. Reference has been made in the course of the debate to the particular challenges uh, for uh, victims. And no one knows better than prosecutors the challenges which victims of crime uh, may face in dealing with the criminal uh, justice uh, system. Um, and uh, no one knows better uh, than prosecutors that unless victims are willing and enabled to speak up in the criminal justice system, we cannot do our job of effectively, rigorously, fairly, and independently prosecuting uh, crime. Uh, and that is why, without for a moment um, trenching on the independent responsibility of the prosecutor, um, we uh, seek to support victims through the criminal justice uh, process. Um, there are just perhaps two points that I should make very briefly, if I may, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, before I close. I would like to have said a great deal more about churn. It was discussed in the debate. The evidence that we've heard, the contributions in the debate, make the case for systemic reform. Um, the, uh, and I, I am committed to working with others in order to secure that reform. Um, the budget was mentioned, um, and I should perhaps just make this point, that I am responsible for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, not the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, I deal directly with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance in relation to the budget of the service, um, and I account uh, 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 to this Parliament uh, as head of the system of prosecution in Scotland, a function which I must exercise independently of any other uh, person. Um, and uh, in relation to the budget, um, uh, we're in the course of the next budget round, and so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, uh, I think, uh, get into that. Uh, but the service will focus on preserving uh, uh, its core functions and its core responsibilities. The inspectorate was touched on, and I would like to make clear that I value the contribution of the uh, inspector, and I value her resolute independence. Uh, and finally, if I might just, uh, again, uh, close um, where I started with the staff of the service, prosecutors who deal with individuals at stressful points in their lives, who take difficult decisions, significant decisions for those involved, and do so fairly rigorously, independently, and without regard to any public controversy which might ensue. They carry out their work in the public eye. What they do is literally tested and judged every time they step into court. I have confidence in them. I thank the committee for all the work that it's done and for the confidence it's expressed in those who prosecute for me, for they deserve the support of the public, which they serve. Thank you, Lord Advocate. And I now call on Rona Mackay to close the debate on behalf of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as Deputy Convener of the Justice Committee, I'm pleased to be able to close today's debate on the Justice Committee's report on the role and purpose of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Firstly, can I thank the Convener, uh, my colleagues in the committee, particularly Fulton McGregor, who broke his paternity leave to come to the Chamber and make a speech today. That's um, dedication to duty. <laughs> Um, and the excellent work done by the clerks whose support was invaluable throughout. 
Today we've had a generally collaborative uh, debate, I think, as Ben McPherson um, said, and I believe, I hope, we've got to the core of this inquiry where all viewpoints must be considered. I have to say at the outset that I thought the convener's um, opening statement was very gloomy, painted a gloomy picture, and I'll, I'll go on to explain why as, as we go along. Presiding officer, at the outset, I'd like to say that the committee's work in carrying out this report would not have been possible without the cooperation of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Accordingly, I'd like to thank the Lord Advocate and Crown Agent David Harvey for their assistance, their openness and their complete willingness to help us conduct this inquiry. I'm sure I speak for my colleagues when I say we were impressed with all participants' total cooperation, whether during evidence sessions or during court visits and committee trips to various locations. And I particularly thank all those who gave evidence, which for some witnesses was certainly not easy. As a new member of the Justice Committee, and again, I'm sure I speak for fellow new members in the committee, I feel this major undertaking was the best initiation into understanding the framework of our legal system I could have asked for, and it helped me enormously as I undertook a steep learning curve. As we've heard in the Chamber today, there are highs and lows in the report. It's such a wide-ranging report, I can't possibly, I don't have time to go through it all in, in great detail, but I hope to cover the essence of the standout parts, so I'll start to go into some of the contributions now. Um, Mary Evans spoke of the Victim Information and Advice Service and how its remit had vastly increased since 2001 when it was set up. Uh, she also spoke of Dr Leslie Thompson's review of victim care in the justice sector and endorsed the single point of contact for victims, which I passionately believe in too. Uh, she said we owe it to victims to recognise and accommodate their needs. Um, and then she made a passionate plea for an improvement in wildlife crime convictions. Um, Douglas Ross um, talked about the need for digital uh, strategy to be progressed. He also spoke about court closures. Um, and again, a, a very gloomy view, and we could, we could abandon statistics all day, but I mean, the, the, the evidence that we have is that 75% of sheriff courts experience no impact on these. And the, in fact, a lot of the cases uh, that their input fail, and the target for domestic abuse was met in full. Um, so I think, as Stuart Stevens has said, it's a balancing of views on this issue. And if, if I had to believe anyone, I think I'd know who I believed. Yes. Oliver Mundell. I thank uh, the member for taking an intervention. Uh, and I wonder if the member would accept that it's not just about efficiency uh, and about how many cases make it through the court, but it's also about how uh, local people feel, including victims and witnesses, who in some cases are now being asked to travel long distances for their day in court. Well done, Mackay. Yes, I do accept, I accept what you're saying, but I mean, there's no, the, I accept what you're saying about people having to travel, but you know, that's, there's downsides to everything, and there's no evidence to say it's, it's been of great detriment uh, so far. Um, Claire Baker spoke of court closures too, um, but she welcomed the positive work being done on domestic abuse and urged that we deal with the issue sensitively. She said that rape victims should always be treated uh, in, in criminal uh, court, and I heart wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, ben McPherson spoke of um, crime and the fear of how the fear of crime has fallen, but progress is still required. Um, he also spoke about uh, the need to work collaboratively at a local level and talked of examples in his own community where uh, cops have been proactive with, with him in his, his own community to um, combat crime in North Edinburgh, which was, which was really encouraging. Oliver Mundell uh, wanted to hear more from local fiscals and wanted them to speak out publicly. Um, he, he praised the National Sexual Crimes Unit, and, and I agree with him on that. He didn't praise the centralised marking system. And I urge caution around more transformative change. Uh, John Finney um, talked of central marking options and the role of cops. Um, he quoted Scottish Women's Aid by saying victims and witnesses' relationship is a human rights issue, which I agree with. And he praised the professionalism and dedication on staff. He welcomed the independent review of legal aid and praised work on sex abuse and sex crimes being done. Um, 
Just on the Victims and Witnesses um, that we've been talking about, the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 enshrines certain rights, such as the early rights to information through the publication of the Victims Code for Scotland and the right to review a decision not to prosecute and eligibility to special measures such as giving uh, evidence from behind a screen to shield the witnesses from the accused or giving evidence via video link. Um, the committee also heard during our evidence session from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice that there's a compelling case for further action to be taken to allow child witnesses to give pre-recorded evidence well in advance of the trial, as happens in many other European countries. And like Fulton McGregor, I was very pleased to hear the Lord Advocate um, today agree with this. Uh, I would welcome this development as it would undoubtedly lessen the trauma to children expected to give evidence in a formal court uh, environment. Uh, Liam MacArthur wanted more support for victims and uh, children and vulnerable witnesses, which I'm sure he would uh, agree with what I've just said. Um, but he asked to keep regionalised marking under review. He also spoke of cybercrime and how it might be skewing the crime statistics slightly due to an element of displacement. Stuart Stevenson gave his usual entertaining speech on um, mentioning the case of John McFeet, um, and his 1830 trial where he was transported to New South Wales for theft, comparing it to the way things are today. But he said crime level was the lowest in 40 years and he praised the prosecutors on that. He also said well-managed change is a force for good. Um, Alexander Stewart possibly gave the gloomiest outlook of all um, in the court today. I didn't hear one positive thing that you said about, about a report. Um, and I don't know if that was deliberate or just an oversight. But um, he was saying that centralisation had gone too far. But he also was asking for more government control. And I begin to wonder if he really believes in an independent judiciary, uh, the way he was talking. So um, that was quite interesting. Um, Gordon Lindhurst spoke of the victim's code um, vulnerable victims missing out in support and said there'd been a lack of communication. Um, Fulton McGregor uh, talked of the cuts imposed by Westminster, which had a massive effect on the budget here. Um, he talked of his professional experience in domestic violence and the importance of um, the digital, um, digital enhancement. And he also spoke of children giving evidence. Mary, talk, Mary Fee talked of the disconnect between prosecutor and victim um, and staffing and resources concerns. And she said support for vulnerable witnesses often fell, sh fell short. And we did, we did hear that. And I think that's something that has been taken on board and, and will most certainly be addressed. And she also wanted more collaboration between the third, the third sector uh, and all stakeholders in the, the third sector. Um, I hope I haven't missed anybody out. Um, just to go back to the digital strategy, I mean, modernisation um, will go a long way to dealing with problems highlighted such as churn and delays, etc. And I think as a committee, we'll keep a very close eye on, on the progress of that um, to, to get it uh, brought forward as quickly as possible. I think I'm running out of time for signing off. So, um, just to conclude, just to say that there's a clear will on the part of all stakeholders involved in, in our inquiry to modernise the Scottish justice system and create a framework, framework suited to the ever-changing needs of the 21st century. It may be a large mountain to climb, but the dedication and professionalism of everyone we spoke to um, makes me assured that we will reach that summit and keep the Scottish justice system's worldwide reputation as a beacon of fairness and a model to aspire to. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate on the Justice Committee inquiry. Uh, we turn now to decision time. There is one question today. The question is that motion 5982, in the name of Margaret Mitchell, on behalf of the Justice Committee on its inquiry into the role and purpose of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. And we'll turn now to members' business in the name of Ivan McKee on the UK Green Deal. Just take a few moments for members to change seats.